pudge and all that stuff. Good evening, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Um, we'll just let our, our participant count get up there. We have a couple issues with um, the city website being down. So we'll, uh, we'll open the meeting up in a second and we'll address those and let everybody know legally what we can do and what we can't do. Okay, so it looks like we leveled off. Uh, so if we could come to order and please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the Republic for which you stand, stand one, one nation, nation under God. 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 Visible, 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 visible. Justice. Okay. Could we have a sunshine announcement, please? Uh, yes. Um, in accordance with the Public Meetings Act, notice of this meeting has been given to the editor of the Jersey Journal, the Jersey City Reporter, and posted with the city clerk on February 5th. This meeting was also posted on the Jersey City Division of City Planning webpage, and all distribution materials made available to the board for published and available to the public. Okay, could we have a roll call, please? Yes. Uh, uh, Vice Chairman Gonzalez? Here. Uh, Commissioner Cruz? Here. Yeah. Commissioner Allen? Here. Yeah. Dr. Desai? Here. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Torres? Here. Yeah. Uh, Council President Waterman? Here. Uh, Commissioner Gangadin? Here. And Chairman Langston. Here. Okay. Please, President. Thank you. Could we swear in the staff, please, Bridget? Do you swear or affirm the testimony or comments you're about to give tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. 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 All right. Thank you. So, under correspondence, I guess this would be correspondence from me to the general public. Uh, we're going to explain what happened. Um, and how we're gonna rectify this tonight. The city website, the, I'm sorry, the city portal, the data portal was down. I'm a little fuzzy on the dates that it was down, but I believe it was down um, starting February 4th. And Erica, you said you thought it was up by the 10th? Um, I believe it was the 5th through, I'm trying to figure out the yes i believe to the 10th okay so it was back up on the 10th so the the data for all these applications all the new applications uh for this agenda weren't available to the public within the 10-day window um that being said, we've carried numerous items from other meetings. So there are things we can hear tonight, but any application that is new on this agenda for tonight, we are not able to hear. Uh, Santo, do you concur with that? <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, I think the uh, items that can be heard should be listed. We have a quorum. We can conduct old business. And I think that it appropriate any of the matters that required notice uh, that won't be heard this evening can be preserved and rescheduled for the subsequent hearing date without further notice of that hearing date. But I do think that it's prudent to uh, carry those matters to another hearing date out of an abundance of caution and respect for, for the public. Uh, I will say that all of these documents were available to the public via contacting planning, but I think that the disruption 
of the portal as identified by you, Mr. Chairman, uh, is a potential problem and the prudent thing to do is exactly how you laid it out with respect to those, those new matters uh, just again out of an abundance of caution. Yeah, I think, you know, just as far as transparency goes, I want to make sure that the, the public has every opportunity, um, you know, that we have under our control legally, we can control whether these are available or not. They weren't available inside that 10 day window. Uh, so let's go down the agenda and we'll look at what is carried, uh, what we can hear. So item number eight uh, is a preliminary and final major site plan with a C variance for 669 Bergen Avenue. That's already being carried to the March 9th meeting. So that will be heard on March 9th. And Mr. Chairman, that's at the request of the applicant. That yeah, that's has at the been request on. of the applicant. Uh, okay, we have a review and discussion of uh, Kyle Marshall and Anthony Boone as certified artists. Uh, that we'll be able to hear tonight. That doesn't require the same notice that a general application needs. Uh, item number 11 tonight is a section 31 review for the Morris Canal Greenway. Uh, that falls under the same thing. We can hear that tonight. That doesn't have the same notice requirements. Um, item 12, 626 Newark Avenue. Uh, we'd be able to hear that tonight, Erica. We're carrying that though. Yes, at the request of the applicant. Okay, so at the request of the applicant, we're carrying that to the March 9th meeting, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, Chairman, uh, on that particular application, we've spoken at prior meetings. It's now been carried. I mean... They are re-noticing because they are modifying the um, plan and they also had re-noticed for this meeting. Okay. We may need to consider removing it from the agenda. I don't know what's procedurally involved in, in the refiling of the application, but if it's not gonna be, is it gonna be heard in the next two meetings or are we talking about we're gonna carry this thing until May? doesn't have to be resolved right now, but food for thought, Chairman. I'll okay. have a discussion with the applicant. Okay, so going down the agenda once again, uh, we're up to item 13, is a minor subdivision and preliminary and final major site plan for 150 Room Street. Uh, Tim, we have a notice situation with that, correct? Yes, they're MIA, so they, have, they will be off the agenda uh, until they properly notice. Okay, so we don't have proper notice for them, so we're adjourning that case. Um, now, Chairman, I think that's also a case where we haven't been able to make contact with the applicant or the applicant's attorney. No. No. I'm sorry, I mean, correct. But yeah. No, we haven't been able to contact anybody. We've had them on. You know, this is our second agenda with them on. I've sent multiple emails and, and crickets. So, but yeah. Chairman, again, my concern is an automatic approval scenario and the fact that we are unable to communicate. Uh, we can, and it is the purview of the board to uh, remove the item, you know, dismiss it without prejudice and have them refile it if and when uh, they decide that they want to revive it. I don't. And know I have, and I have previous emails, Santa, that uh, say that they do. They do understand that they were scheduled originally, so that also would uh, keep them from doing the uh, forty-five days. So they okay. were scheduled. Okay, so that application we are adjourning. Correct. We're calling it adjourned. Yeah, I, I would think the so. Public. The public will receive notice when that'll be back on. Uh, item 14, we have a preliminary and final ma major site plan with C variances for 189, I'm sorry, 181 to 189 Academy Street. Uh, that we are able to hear tonight. That was carried from a previous meeting. So those documents were available on the data portal. 
prior to the 10 days. Uh, we have item 15 is a preliminary and final major site plan for 15 Park Lane South. Uh, once again, that was available on the data portal. That was on a previous agenda. So that will be hearing tonight. Um, item 16 for 124 to 142 Bay Street and 130 Bay Street. That was not available. So that will be carrying to March 9th. Um, do we need to bring any any attorneys up as we're doing this, or should we just go down the list? I see one attorney's hands raised. I'm trying to, it's Don Pepe. Can't, I'm not sure which application he's for. If another planner knows. 198 Academy. Okay. I'm getting to that, Don. <laughs> okay, do we have Gerard Pazillo? Yes, I can promote him. I'll promote him. Am I on mute? Okay. Okay. Promoting him. Guys, if you're not speaking, can you mute your... There's a lot of feedback. I hear um, chirping and if you can please do that. If you're not speaking, mute yourself. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, Commissioners. Council, good evening. Um, yeah, I apologize on behalf of the city that the website was down, that the data portal was down. Um, I think you understand what we're looking at here. Um, we are going to have to carry that item uh, to March 9th. Okay, I understand. And that uh, was not noticed, correct? That's correct. Chairman, it's a simple administrative amendment, so it wasn't noticed. Okay. Uh, do you have anything on, else on tonight, Gerard? No. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Sorry to bring you on with uh, without no anything from us tonight. I apologize. No worries. Have a good night. Thank you, guys. Right, you too. All right. So let's bring up Don Pepe. Um, we're going to talk about case uh, P20-155 is item 17 on the agenda tonight for 198 Academy Street. And uh, council, I don't know if you're on yet, but this was on a previous agenda. And good, good evening, Commissioner Don Pepe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to point out, although it's not noted here, we were previously listed. Uh, we've been carried forward. Wasn't yeah. the application, but our plans were in, and I think we're in a suitable position to be heard. Yeah. Yeah, you were, uh, you were on the previous agenda. Your plans were in already. Uh, so yeah, we can hear you tonight. Thank you. All okay, right. so that's... Okay. That's for 198 Academy Street we'll hear tonight. Uh, going down the list, item 18 for P20-167 for 8-10 Columbus Drive. Uh, it's an administrative amendment. Uh, Charles Harrington is the attorney. Uh, that do we want to bring Mr. Harrington up? Good evening, Council. Good evening. Hi. Uh, unfortunately, we're in the same boat here with your application. Understood. Um, do you have anything else? Um, I just have the prior one that we can hear on, on Academy Street. Okay. 14. So nothing, nothing past this item, correct? No. Okay. So we'll, uh, again, we'll push you off till March 9th. Like everybody else, I apologize. Uh, and we'll see in a couple minutes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. So case P20-167 for 8-10 Columbus Drive, administrative amendment. That's carried to a date certain. March 9th, uh, going down the list, uh, item 19, case P20-159 is an administrative amendment for one Parkview Avenue. Um, do we wanna bring Jim McCann up? It looks like- we Yes, can, uh, I just promoted him. We can polish off the rest of our agenda almost with Jim McCann. 
Those, all of Jim's were requested to be carried anyway. Oh. Yeah, those are all part of the Senate plan amendments. Sorry, three of the four were. Item 19 for One Park View Avenue was not. Oh, oh. Right. All right. Good evening, commissioners. Council, good evening. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that's one of the uh, applications that falls under this being, you know, not available in the 10 day notice period. Uh, so we're going to have to carry Park View Ave to March 9th. And yeah, the applicant consents to that, um, Mr. Chairman, no problem. Okay, thank you. We appreciate it. And while and we have you, uh, I didn't know anything else was carried. So uh, item 20 P20-160 for 540 Washington Boulevard. It's also an administrative amendment. Uh, we're carrying that as well to March 9th. Uh, yes, Chairman. Yes, Chairman. Okay. Applicant consents. All right, thank you. Uh, also case P20-161 is an administrative amendment for 479 Washington Boulevard. Uh, that's being carried to a date certain March 9th. Yes. Applicant consents with preservation of notice because we did notice and tendered our notice uh, affidavits. Yes, with preservation. Absolutely, Council. Thank uh, you. Okay, also item 22, P20-162 uh, for 30, 20, 40, 50, Mall Drive West, also an administrative amendment. Uh, we're carrying that to a date certain March 9th with preservation of notice. Yes, applicant consents. Okay, thank you, Council. And uh, I think that's it for you. We'll see you in a couple minutes also. Don't leave yet. Yes. I <laughs> appreciate it. I will not. Right. Uh, okay, so item 23 on the agenda, P20-132 is a minor subdivision for 82 Patterson Ave. Patterson Ave, I think it is, correct? Street, I think, but... Uh... In, in any case, the, the applicant consents. Thank you, Council. Okay, so we're carrying uh, P20-132 as a minor subdivision uh, to a date certain March 9th. Uh, Council, do you wanna speak for your colleague? Yes, uh, the applicant also consents to number 24, P18-181. Okay, thank you. So P18-181 is a minor subdivision and site plan with C variances for 43 Belmont Ave. Belmont Ave or Belmont Street? It's not listed. I think it's um, that I, th I think is Avenue. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, so that's being carried to a date certain to be March 9th. Okay. That's All it. Right. Thank you. Council, thanks for coming in. I apologize. No worries. All right, so let's get back on track, everybody. Uh, that's the entire agenda. So we can open up um, a new business. Uh, item 10 is the review and discussion of Kyle Marshall and Anthony Boone as certified artists. Formal action may be taken. Uh, oh, Chairman. Erica, before I call that, um, Erica, do we have any other correspondence that I didn't cover tonight? I can't imagine we do. I don't believe we have anything else. Okay. And Chairman, maybe it's appropriate just to make an announcement for those people in the public that any of those applications that had been noticed and are now carried, they will be on the March 9th hearing and there will be no further notice of those matters. So if you were here on any one of those applications, that was carried to March 9th and you received a letter about it, you will not receive another letter. It will be on March 9th. You should zoom in to that meeting on March 9th. Thank you, Council. Okay, so let's uh, once again, get back on track. Uh, review and discussion of Kyle Marshall and Anthony Boone, certified artists, formal action may be taken. Um, who handles this? Is Erica, do you handle these? I can handle it. Um, for some reason, I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen. This is embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Okay, hold on. Hold on. 
Let me see, what am I doing? Okay. All right, so um, Joanne Morales provided this uh, memo regarding the certification of these three, is this the correct? Oops, I'm not sure if this is the correct Hello? one. Are these the correct ones? One moment. Hello? Hello? They're, they're not the correct ones, Erica. No, I think I went to the wrong link. Let me stop sharing for a second. That's the link that comes up. That's the link that's on our agenda. That's yep. what I'm looking at right now. One moment. You should carry this item then. Yeah, we have to carry this one. We'll fix the link and we'll we'll put it at the top of the next agenda. Okay, so I apologize to Kyle Marshall and Anthony Boone. Um, we can't look at your lovely works tonight. So we will carry that also to a date certain to be March 9th. All right, uh, moving on. Case P20-177 is a section 31 review for the Morris Canal Greenway. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, this is a, a project for your review and, and approval, if you so choose, for uh, advancement of the Morris Canal Greenway project in Jersey City. We have a member of our consultant team here tonight to go through the, a presentation um, and walk you through the plans, but I'll provide a little bit of an overview of the project. So the purpose of the Morris Canal Greenway, which is actually a regional project consisting of a 111 mile trail is to establish a pedestrian and bike greenway or trail as a way to offer opportunities for active transportation, recreation and um, open space within Jersey City and in communities outside of Jersey City. We have been working on this plan for several years now. In 2012 and 2013, there was a year long planning study done within Jersey City to identify the alignment of the Morris Canal and to choose an alignment um, as close to the historic Morris Canal itself that can be used to establish pedestrian and bike facilities. And um, that planning study led to quite a bit of work being done in Jersey City over the past few years. I'll note that the Hudson River Waterfront Walkway is a part of the Morris Canal Greenway alignment, as well as the path um, along Berry Lane Park. So we've provided for you a segment map showing all of the on-road and off-road segments that consist of the Morris Canal Greenway in Jersey City. Uh, the few that I mentioned just now, Berry Lane Park and Hudson River Waterfront Walkway are complete. A majority of them are not complete. Uh, some of them are in progress. In 2018, the city received a $3.5 million grant to construct additional segments of the Greenway. And we prioritize the segments that are located specifically in wards A and F. So um, as we go through the presentation tonight, we'll make reference to those specific segments. Um, segment three is on the west side of Jersey City in the country village portion uh, along Sullivan Drive segment. And that is uh, the only segment that we're gonna talk about today that, can, that includes an off-road path. Segments five, 10, and 11 are located in wards A and F and they are primarily on street. So what we're going to present to you is essentially the treatment um, for these greenway segments, what they will look like off-road and off and on street, and how they comport with the Jersey City Master Plan, specifically the circulation element, which was recently updated with our bikeway design guide um, and the open space element. So I'm gonna turn it over to our consultant, uh, Pete Bondar from TNM to present the plans and answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Barca, we appreciate it. Uh, Am I swearing him, uh, Chris? Um, I'm not yeah, sure probably section good. 31. I'm sorry? Yes, we, we should. Okay. Would you raise your right hand, please, Warren? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I affirm. And please state and spell your full name for the record. 
Uh, my name is Peter Bondar of TNM Associates. I'm a professional engineer uh, licensed in the state of New Jersey. I am a graduate in civil engineering of Rutgers University, and I've been practicing civil engineering for approximately 20 years in the state. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bondar. Good evening. Uh, and your license in New Jersey is current tonight? Yes. Okay, you're qualified. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, Barca, thank you for the introduction. Um, am I, can I share my screen? Yes, you can share your screen. Okay, great, thanks. Mr. Bondar, is this gonna be a PowerPoint type presentation? Uh, I have a um, the actual plans to look at. Okay. So, can you guys uh, see my plants? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, we can't see them yet. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> and these are the same plans that we've seen, so we don't have to mark. Okay, thank you. Have there been any revisions? Uh, there has been a couple revisions on a couple sheets. So then let's just mark the whole thing as A1 for the record, just sure. in case there's anything uh, slightly modified. Sure. Thank you, Council. Uh, so as Barkett indicated, uh, this project consists of uh, four segments or sec sections. Uh, the first section is uh, section three, what we refer to as the country village section, um, which basically runs uh, from the Route, 40, Route 440 jug handle with uh, Society Hill um, at Danforth Avenue, down the original alignment of the canal, down to McGovern Park. Um, so these plans. So right here is McGovern Park, right up here. Uh, these are the stairs that lead down to McGovern Park from uh, Gates Avenue, if you're familiar with the area. Uh, right now, this is about a 50 foot uh, right away, give or take. There's some existing utilities running through it. Um, currently, it is um, vacant. There's some trees, a few trees here and there, but mostly just uh, grass and some gravel. And the trail, the proposed improvements will consist of a 10 foot wide trail, uh, will consist of porous pavement, and along with that, there will be uh, landscaping, as you see here, uh, lighting improvements. Every about 70 feet, there will be a, a decorative light. Mr. Um, Bondar, I'm sorry, this is Vice Chair Gonzalez. I don't want mean to interrupt. I don't see anything on the screen. Or is everybody, are you sharing something already? I see it. You see it? Um, I see it. Yeah, I see it, Orlando. I see it. Oh, boy. Okay. I see <laughs> nothing. I see... Uh, a Zoom uh, screen here. I mean, I see you speaking, but okay. okay. Um, go ahead. Let me try to figure it out on my end. I just want to make sure everybody else is looking at it. Not a problem. Yeah, it's uh, never uh, easy. With no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, like I said, this uh, segment is about 3,000 feet long, give or take, and it will be in completely off road. Uh, so, 10 foot wide trail. Um, with landscaping, a significant amount of trees we're going to propose uh, along the the trail. Um, we are also proposing um, a good amount of uh, drainage along the trail. So right now, this area is in a flood zone, and we have received approval from the NJDEP for this project. So we are including um, some under drain and storage volume, and the project will store approximately um, 17,000 cubic feet of uh, stormwater through pipes and, and gravel. So the trail is both uh, recreational improvement as well as you know providing some stormwater improvement. Like I said, there's porous pavement also, so there will be no net increase in uh, impervious coverage for the project. Just go through a couple. Um, 
these are just grading. I'll get to the landscaping plan, which um, I think give you a good idea of what um, the project will look like. Uh, right here is McGovern Park at the top left and the stairs going up to Gates Avenue. Um, and we have put trees basically every 50 feet along the entire right of way and really enhance the landscaping at um, the endpoints. So here at Gates, um, here at Mina, Mina Avenue, Mina Drive, I believe. Um, a little bit here at uh, Bartholi Crossing. And then as you get down to Sullivan, some significant landscaping as you move down. Um, along you get along Sullivan Drive also. And that's really uh, segment three um, or section three you call it. And then that segment ends at McGovern Park and we go on road at um, Custard Avenue, which proceeds up to, to JFK Boulevard. And that connects into segment four, which is not part of this project. That is a, um, a county funded project. So that goes through um, JFK Avenue and then over to um, Mercer Park, yes. And then we start, start uh, segment five, which um, I'll move up to that. So this is uh, section five or segment five. And the top left is um, McGovern, not McGovern Park, that's Mercer Park. And this is where we uh, start the on-street segments. Basically, um, generally speaking, this entire segment will consist of uh, super showers, which are basically the little, um, you know, painted bicycle men you probably see um, around town. And basically start at the trail, which the county is building at Mercer Park and proceed up Merritt Street. And then we get to Avenue C. Um, I don't know if you know this intersection, it is um, pretty busy. Most of the traffic comes down Merritt from Ocean and makes a left Avenue C if you're trying to get to the to Bayonne or the Turnpike. And right now there is no crosswalk across Merritt Street and a long crosswalk here across Avenue C. So what we're proposing is to build a, um, a bump out along Merritt Street, this corner, the south uh, west corner with a rain garden and then put a crosswalk across Merritt Street um, to really uh, provide a safe uh, crossing spot and we were able to reduce the crossing length there um, and like I said most of the traffic is going uh, left down Avenue C. So proceeding on Merritt Street we have the Sharrows and then we were able to put put a protected bike lane on one segment on Merritt Street between Ocean and Garfield. Um, this has no parking right now, so there will be no impact to parking. And then the trail uh, goes north up Garfield Avenue. Again, we go back to the Sharrows and it proceeds up Garfield. And then Garfield's right here. And then we have two, two options really. Uh, since Gates and Seaview are both one-way streets, uh, we have the Sharrows going east to west on Gates, and then the Sharrows going west to east on Seaview, depending which way you travel. And that then proceeds to Princeton Avenue here, basically starting at Gates Avenue and heading north to Linden. So again, uh, Sharrows that whole length. We're able also to put um, Again, some bump outs and rain gardens on several of the corners along Princeton Avenue. So this is Neptune Street and these four um, kind of rectangles you see here are rain gardens. Uh, so that will help with um, the stormwater before it enters the, the system. And we head up Princeton again, we have a couple um, rain gardens and bump outs at Winfield. Uh, Persall and Lembeck. Then once we get to the, the signalized intersection at Princeton and Linden Avenue, uh, we're able to then go back to a protected bike lane each direction along Linden Avenue, um, across the railroad tracks. Actually, I think that's the, um, the light rail there. 
and this is basically the entrance to the um, Jersey City Public Works, and we can continue down a little bit to where we get to the turnpike. Uh, and that is segment five. And then segment 10 is uh, what we refer to as the uh, Whitlock Cordage segment. Uh, this is actually back um, off road again. So if you look left to orientate yourself, this is a Communipal Avenue. And on the other side, uh, just uh, south of Gates Avenue. And the other side of Communipal is where the existing trail ends, uh, which is part of uh, Berry Lane Park. So basically, we're going to continue that trail across Communipal and then a, um, a 10 foot wide trail similar to the, the country village section. Um, this right away is a little smaller, so there's less um, available green space for um, landscaping. So generally, it's going to be a 10 foot wide trail with lighting and you know the remaining area will just be landscapes with grass. And this runs along um, the original alignment of the trail, or the Morris Canal, I should say, uh, right next to the Whitlock um, Cordage development, which I think it's called the uh, Whitlock Mills there. And that proceeds down to <clears throat> Maple Avenue. And right here, the bottom right is uh, Lafayette Park. So this is where we then proceed back on road again at Maple Avenue. Um, this is just the, the grading plants. Sorry, go back one. <clears throat> so we go off, we're on road right here at Whitlock Cordage. And then we run along down Maple Street next to Lafayette Park uh, with the showers again. And then when you get to Van Horn, again, you have two options. Uh, since we have one way streets, uh, you can travel Van Horn kind of northeast. Um, up this way towards uh, Johnson Avenue, or if you're coming the other way, you would come down Holiday. <clears throat> and then Van Horn and Holiday kind of meet at Carbon Street is kind of where our project limit ends. Um, right here is, um, there's an existing trail. This is part of the Jersey City, um, I forget the name of it. It's um, the housing development and then Pacific Avenue is at the end and that will connect to the existing trail that was just the bike lanes I should say that was just built along uh, Pacific Avenue. And that's I'll, I'll just share this real quick. Um, this is kind of a, a pretty feature of you know how things are going to look. This is the <clears throat> um, country village segment. So these are the step at the bottom. These are the steps right at the um, Mercer Park, not Mercer Park, McGovern Park. And this is just kind of a um, rendering with some of the proposed landscaping, what it's going to look like. And then along here will be where the, uh, the pros trail will go. And again, it's about a 10 foot wide trail with the remainder um, landscapes. Um, so that kind of are the highlights. Um, um, Mr. Bondar, if we could, can we show the the overview map? Sure. And just give that a quick look for everybody. So, um, probably the first segment is here, segment three. Uh, you got 440 kind of running right here along Newark Bay. And our trail is going to run along here to McGovern Park. That's the, the off-road segment. This one has it a little bit different um, since this was the, the long, the prior alignment, but we were able to secure the, the right of way to follow the existing um, Morse Canal alignment here. Um, this is JFK. And then here is Mercer Park. And then you're running down Merritt uh, up um, Garfield, I believe that one is. That's Garfield. Um, and then Princeton here up to Linden Avenue. So those are segments three and five. And then to get back to where the other two segments, 10 and 11, 
we have uh, Barry Lane Park, which is number nine right here. Uh, Commuta Paul is running right here. So we're starting up with segment 10 of the Whitlock Cordage along here into Lafayette Park along here, then on road as we get to Pacific Avenue, uh, which has the existing bike lanes right about here. Okay, thank you. And um, one last thing, if we could, uh, just for, you know, the information of the board who does, you know, the members that don't bike and uh, anybody from the public that doesn't know what they are, could you just go over what a Sharo is? So a Sharo is um, basically a shared uh, marking. So basically it goes generally in the center of the travel lane and it just alerts both um, vehicles and cyclists that the road is to be shared um, by both cyclists and um, motorists. So I generally use that where there's not sufficient room to fit in a bike lane. And Jersey City, we have what's considered a super shower. So it's a little bit larger and underneath it, it's, there's green paint to kind of highlight that you know, this area needs to be shared by both a bicyclist and motorist. Okay. Um, he isn't familiar with those markings. We, we currently have them on the ground um, on Grand Street east of Grove Street where the protected bike lane ends um, and, and it alerts cyclists to where they should position themselves in the roadway as they're sharing the lane with vehicles, which by New Jersey state law, they're permitted to do. Uh, so to give a little bit of context, yeah, Pete, why don't you pull up an example of that? Um, there it is. So typically uh, you would see these bike markings just in the white paint um, on the roadway. And in Jersey City through the bikeway design guide, we've decided to elevate those with green backed paint. Uh, to increase the visibility of these shadows and alert drivers that cyclists belong in the travel lane if they don't have a bicycling facility available to them. And just for the record, you know, even though they're not painted, technically every street yes. that have a protected bike lane in Jersey City is a shadow. Correct. Every street that doesn't have a protected bike lane um, is, is able to be used by cyclists and cyclists are uh, permitted by law to occupy the full lane when they need to uh, if they're sharing the street with vehicles. Okay. And um, I, I just wanna provide some context. Um, we have had a series of public outreach opportunities for this project and, and the main community meeting that we held was one where we showed alternatives, which is what Pete has up on the screen right now. Um, where we provided an alternative that would implement full protected bike lanes on some of these streets. And then another alternative that just had the super sharrows. And we took the lead of the community members and council members who represent these neighborhoods to determine what the final design would be. So we've been able to, to advance protected bike lanes on some of the streets where there wouldn't be significant parking loss required as a, as a trade-off due to the constraints of the streets. But on many of the more local and residential streets, there was not support for the protected bike lanes. And so that's why we've implemented the sharrows, but we've also made sure to include some traffic calming features like the curb extensions, like greenery in the street and anything that would add friction um, to slow down vehicular traffic and make pedestrians and cyclists feel more comfortable and have it feel like as much of a green way as possible. Okay, thank you, Barca. Uh, anything else, guys? Does that uh, complete the presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so at this time, anybody, uh, any questions? Yes, I just have one question. Sure, go ahead, Jeffrey. Good evening. Um, my, my only question is, I saw on one of the pages where it said um, security cameras and lights. Will there be new lights installed or, they, uh, or the lights will be shared with the street lights that are already there? Uh, on the, the off-road segments, there will be new lighting okay. on both uh, off-road segments. The on-road segments, uh, no new lighting is proposed right now. 
Okay. Okay, thanks, Jeffrey. Anybody else, any questions? All right, thank you guys. Nice job, nice presentation. Thank you. Um, all right, so at this time we'll open it up for public comment. If anybody's here from the public that wants to comment, you can raise your hand. If you are calling in and you'd like to comment, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And promoting David Cruz. And if we could, could we uh, take down the screen sharing? Thank you. David Cruz. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm unmuted now. Um, hi, and thanks. I actually have two questions. Just one second, Mr. Cruz. Are you able to turn on your video? Uh, yeah, had I not? Oh, window was closed, yeah. Uh -huh. Mr. Cruz, you have to be sworn. So uh, if you could just raise your right hand and we'll get you sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Um, to the extent that I'm going to give testimony, yes, but I don't expect to give testimony. I just have questions, but okay. Okay. Yes. And we have five minutes for you. All right. My, my one question is, um, is there a, an overall map um, that encompasses all of the segments that we just saw? There is. Um, if we could, let's get your other question down. And the other question is, is technically unrelated, but I got a notice about 370-372 Princeton that was supposed to be on the February 2nd meeting and never showed up there. And what's the status of that? Do you know? That notice was incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why it was sent out, uh, but you'll get another notice. Um, to the best of my knowledge, that will be on maybe sometime in March, but I'm not positive. But you will get another notice on it. Okay. Um, if you do get notice on something, definitely check the web portal. Uh, it should, you know, the notice should have. Yeah, I, I checked on the February 2nd agenda and it wasn't on. Yeah. Um, and did you have a February 2nd meeting? We did. You did, all right, yeah. Yes, yeah, that, was, uh, that notice was sent out improperly by the attorney for the application. Um, and, you know, you weren't there, but um, I did, you know, tell the public we, and I think as you've seen tonight, we err on the side of caution. Yeah. So I wanna make sure everybody's heard, everybody that wants to speak about something is heard. So if it's not on our agenda or it was improperly noticed, we don't hear it. Got it. Okay, thank you. So um, if we could, maybe we'll point you towards the overall map. Um, Barka, is that available somewhere on the data portal? Yeah, Chairman, we can, um, I don't know if Erica or Matt want to provide a link to the data portal, but the, the best place to find the map and all of the background information, previous presentations and all of that would be the Jersey City website. So the link is jcnj.org slash Morris Canal Greenway. And you'll see materials, um, anything that's been made public to date uh, since we've been working on the project that wasn't presented here today. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Thank Cruz, you. anything else? No, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else from public, if you could, please raise your hand if you'd like to comment. If you're calling in, once again, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Anybody else from public? For sure, seeing no more public, I move to close the public portion. Second it. Okay. Second it. Motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Um, okay, it's a section 31 review, everybody. Uh, I don't think we really need any extra comment from staff unless somebody wants to provide some. Okay, I'll entertain a motion then. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion at this time to approve case P20 dash 177 as presented to the board tonight. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded for approval. 
Uh, motion to approve, Commissioner Gonzalez. Love it. Uh, I vote aye. Commissioner Cruz. Aye. Commissioner Torres. Thank you for a very, very wonderful job in all these years. Um, and you did a very a good job at whole staff on these uh, bicycle lanes. I vote aye. Commissioner Allen. Uh, great idea. If I get some time to utilize it, I will. I vote <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Desai. I vote aye. Council President Waterman. I vote aye. Commissioner Gangadin. Great project. Thank you so much uh, for the time and effort from the entire team. I vote aye. And Chairman Langston. Yeah, I agree with everybody. Uh, great job on this. Um, this is, you know, I've talked about this for years. This is really important to the future of the city. Uh, and Jeffrey, if you can stay six feet away from me, man, I'll take you out there. <laughs> I'm your freight. I'm going to take you up on your offer. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. It's an eye for me. Motion carries all in favor. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to the next item is uh, number 14 on the agenda uh, is case P20-093. Is a preliminary and final major site plan with C variances uh, for 181 to 189 Academy Street. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Council. Okay, um, so we'll jump jump right in. Um, uh, for the record, Charles Harrington of Connell Foley on behalf of the applicant. And I actually note for the record, the, the agenda that I have lists Robert and Cynthia Williams as the applicant. Um, the uh, application and the public notices list um, my client's entity, 181-189 Academy, Academy LLC as the applicant. I'm not sure how that made it, it made its way that Robert and Cynthia, I believe, are the current owners, um, and my clients are the contract purchasers. Mm. So just to clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Harrington. Uh, Chairman, I'm in receipt of the affidavit of publication proof of mailing with respect to this application for 181-189 Academy LLC. I find that the notices are in order and jurisdictions proper before the board. And I do note that uh, the applicant is 181-189 Academy and apparently was consented to by uh, the Williams. So uh, Mr. Harrington is absolutely correct. And thank you. All right. Thank you. Identified in the so uh, the application before you tonight is for uh, property in zone four of the Journal Square uh, 2060 redevelopment plan. Um, this uh, is located on Academy Street. There's been uh, a lot of activity and a lot of the, uh, um, a lot of uh, projects coming up on Academy Street. Uh, uh, so this is a continuation of, of that, if if you will. Uh, there is a project right across the street, uh, 190 Academy, that is has just uh, actually uh, finished. Um, I know there's an, there's one coming up later on the agenda at the corner of Summit and Academy Street. Uh, this board approved uh, a project immediately uh, to the west of this property uh, a few months ago. And there's also a, an approval for a property at the corner of Baldwin and Summit, uh, uh, a few lots down as well. So there's a lot of activity here. And the board may recall this property as part of a subdivision application that we had before you. Uh, actually, you know, time flies. I think it was about a year ago. And we came back to the board uh, sometime in October for an extension um, so that we could uh, effectuate the subdivision. So now we're back here tonight um, for uh, the proposed site plan. Um, and you'll see as part of this presentation, it's a little bit of an irregular lot. Uh, there are some, some issues uh, with the configuration that we tried to work into the, the development. There's also a portion of the lot that is actually has a deed restriction from way back when, when the city apparently owned a portion of it that restricted, um, uh, it said condominium uh, use, residential condominiums on that portion. So uh, 
the long and short of it, instead of, of getting into the weeds as to what that permitted or restricted, uh, my clients made the decision to just leave it, leave it open um, as part of this project. Um, so you'll see that as part of it. Uh, it is, uh, I think, a little bit different from some other projects you're going to see because we have some some uh, backyard space uh, that's dedicated to specific units and then also to the um, the general uh, um, occupants of the building. So uh, it is a proposed six-story building with 70 residential units, and there's five parking spaces that's provided as as well. So um, there are some deviations that that we are asking there, you, you'll see there's, there's I think six in total, um, but in the aggregate there, they, you know, I'm submitting that there are minor uh, deviations from, from the redevelopment plan uh, provisions. Uh, I also note that the, the agenda list that we're asking for a deviation from the outdoor recreation area, that that is not um, accurate in that we, uh, maybe at one point in the initial application we were, but that uh, is not the case now. So I have um, two witnesses tonight. Um, I do have my civil engineer uh, as well, in, in case there's any engineering uh, questions, but uh, Anthony D'Agosta uh, is our architect, and I'm going to lead off with Anthony, uh, and then Mr. Colling will, will come forward um, and address the requested deviations. Okay, thank you, Council. You raise your right hand to be sworn and unmute yourself. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And please state and spell your full name for the record. Anthony D. Augusta, A N T H O N Y, capital D apostrophe A G O S T A. Thank you. D. Augusta, good evening. Uh, I don't recall qualifying you. Have we ever qualified you? You have. Yeah, we have. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I this whole scenario, I don't take it personal. <laughs> I can't recognize anybody up close. Uh, and, you know. Uh, so, is your uh, license current tonight in the state of New Jersey? It sure is. Okay, thank you. You're qualified then. Thank you. So, uh, Chuck, thank you for that uh, that summation. Um, we'll get right to it. Uh, let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, good start. So um, I will uh, orient our, our audience to uh, where we are on site. Um, our property uh, exists on the south side of Academy Street and we're generally running um, a good portion of the site uh, east to west. We have a small side yard um, on our west, a uh, four foot and four foot plus uh, on, on our side yard here. And in general, we're running property line uh, along our western border or eastern border here. Um, as Chuck had alluded to, at the ground floor, we're providing some outdoor space for the residents of the ground floor, private terrace space for those units, as well as a communal space for the building, uh, a roughly 1,300 square foot dog run is what this green uh, and, and beige area is representing. Um, the darker outline in this sort of H-shaped shaped building uh, represents the six stories that rises up. We have some setbacks that we'll, we'll get into once we uh, take a look at our elevations. But by and large, uh, we have a, a six foot, uh, I'm sorry, a six story, 70 unit building occupying uh, a good chunk of the property. Um, at, the, at the ground floor, um, I'll kind of walk us through uh, the, the use of, of our ground floor. Um, we have uh, a parking area that, that provides five parking stalls for the building, as well as some, uh, actually, I'm sorry. That's better. Uh, it also provides uh, five ground floor units that, as I mentioned, uh, have access to their own private yards. Um, and a transformer sp space that uh, is requisite for a building of this size and some utility space that fronts the building. And then we have a general amenity space for the, the, the tenants of the building, roughly 850 square feet. Um, the building is served by two passenger elevators and a pair of uh, egress stairs. Um, and our uh, ground floor also has a compactor room um, that will, will serve the single trash chute that feeds the upper stories of the building. Um, our trash chute um, 
our trash chute is one that that is is capable of of carrying the load of, of 70 units um, a typical floor as you see before you is comprised of 13 units uh, and sort of a mixed bag of, of units and, and what their typology is. But in general, we have 21 studio apartments, uh, 37 one bedroom apartments and 12 two bedroom apartments. Um, the size of those units range from the studio end from 490 square feet to 555. The one bedrooms are 695 square feet to 745. And the two bedrooms are 950 square feet to just over a thousand square feet. Um, and in general, uh, some of these one bedrooms do have uh, uh, den spaces or a work from home area. Um, this was, as, as Chuck alluded to, uh, in the works before the, uh, the world shut down. Uh, and I think we've taken advantage um, and, and, and recognized the, the value of having some of that work from home space. I can, I can assure you, if I didn't have a filter on the back of my, uh, my presentation right now, you would be endured with a beautiful array of children's toys. So I think any work from home space in an apartment building is sort of appreciated at this point. So we've we've sprinkled that as best we could across the property in a few units. Um, and some of these uh, second floor units uh, have their own private terrace area as well. Um, these notches that step in uh, on the building, uh, one provide the requisite step back for our uh, window exposure for those units that face those side yards, but also provide some private outdoor space. So we have a small terrace that feeds this one bedroom here and another that feeds this one bedroom this year. Um, and then the units that, that face here also have some, some private area as well. Um, and those were, would be you know, screened appropriately to uh, provide the requisite privacy for those units that, that use, utilize that space. Um, the, uh, the, the building is also, uh, from an amenity standpoint, um, taking advantage of a rooftop space of roughly uh, 1,750 square feet. Uh, that space uh, is, is you know, open to the, the, the residents of the building sort of uh, nothing terribly unique about this space from what you've seen before you on, on other projects. This space sort of feeds um, the need to, uh, to, to get above the ground floor um, and, and provide some outdoor space to the residents of the building. Um, there is a small vestibule uh, and, and restroom to serve that space. Um, it is fronted sort of on the, on the northern side of the, the property um, and that, that space will take advantage of the elevator and, and stair uh, to handle our code requisites. Um, the building will be fully adaptable as required by code, meaning all apartments will be uh, fully handicap accessible or at least adaptable, uh, and it'll be fully sprinkled as well. As well. Um, the, uh, the units themselves, the apartments themselves will also have individualized heating and cooling. Um, there will be no centralized heating and cooling on this project. Every tenant will have control of their own heating and cooling. Um, from an, uh, an aesthetic standpoint, um, not to bore you with 2D graphics, but um, from a colorized standpoint, um, we have a mix of brick uh, and uh, a fiber cement panel, as well as some uh, wood look aluminum paneling to kind of highlight the, the rendering that we'll, we'll look, look at in just a moment, as well as anchored by some cast stone at the base of the building uh, and the PTAC grills that, that are, are utilized to uh, discreetly hide the PTACs of our building. Um, from the from a vantage uh, looking, uh, I guess this would be looking northeast or northwest. Um, the 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 palette is such that we're prioritizing the facade that fronts Academy Street with a, a fair amount of of glazing, uh, complemented by the the brick and fiber cement that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, this the adjacent the side yard uh, facades are are going to be uh, coated with a cementitious product. Uh, again, to, to match in general palette and tone of the exterior of the building. Uh, but by and large, um, the ground floor is one that's sort of anchored with cast stone, complemented with brick, and then uh, uh, supplemented with some aluminum siding, um, wood look aluminum siding uh, on the, the front facade of the building. And then the remaining three facades of the building are, are sort of uh, very similar as they're comprised of, uh, again, that, that cementitious uh, stucco finish on the, the exterior of the building. Um, beyond that, uh, I don't have much more, uh, Chuck. Well, yeah, no, let's, uh, open it up then if uh, the board has any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. D'Augusta. Um, the application lists 20 parking spaces. I, I don't think that's correct, right? 
No, it's it's five. Okay, so it's five parking spaces. Okay, anybody else? Any questions for Mr. D'Augusta? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank okay. you. And just uh, for the record, again, we do have our civil engineer uh, here tonight in, in the event there's any questions for him. Um, I, I note that we did receive the review comment letters and we don't have any issues addressing or, or complying with uh, their comments. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily have any questions right now for uh, the civil engineer, but you know, we'll, we'll keep that in the back pocket. Okay. All right, thank you. So with that said, I'm gonna move on to Mr. Collins so he can address the requested deviations. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, yes, I do. And could you state and spell your full name for the record? His first name is Edward, E-D-W-A-R-D, Colling, K-O-L-L-I-N-G, a licensed professional planner, and my license is current. Thank you, Mr. Colling, Colling you're qualified. Okay, Ed, if you could... Uh benefit of, of your reasoning uh, to the board for the request to be here. Certainly. First, uh, I think the board's aware of the lo location. As the architect mentions, the south side of Academy Street. It's a five or 10 minute walk to the journal, to journal Square and the Transportation Center. Um, in terms of the character Academy, Academy Street in this location, there are uh, some smaller wood frame uh, dwellings, smaller buildings, but there's also been uh, new construction on the block. Um, at the corner of Summit, there's an older four-story apartment building that's built to the street line. That's just followed by a six-story newer construction. Also, I'd point out that at the other end of the block, the east end, there's a 12-story apartment building, I believe it is, that was approved uh, on a rather large surface parking lot that's, that's in that location. So the area is transitioning really from having these smaller buildings uh, to have being developed more with... Um, the mid-rise apartment buildings. That's true on the opposite side of the street. There's a couple of newer buildings already there. There's another under construction and uh, another one that's already approved. The property as was described is, and as you've seen is rather irregular. It's also very large. It's like 15,500 square feet, just about. It ranges in depth from 124, 125 feet up to maybe around 140 feet. Um, so it's a little bit un unique in that in that regard. Um, in terms of the project, I won't go into or repeat what the architect has already said, but I think uh, that it's 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 fitting that it's a good comment. I think at least to talk about how fitting an essentially rectangular building into such an irregular lot is not without its challenges. I think the architect's done an excellent job of fitting that in there. He's been able to then use those spaces that were sort of left over as ground floor or really ground level open space, which is fairly un unusual. A lot of times in buildings like this, the open space ends up being above the grade at the first floor. And these spaces function, as was pointed out, as uh, essentially rear yards for some of the units, and in other cases as com common open space. So I think that's a, 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 a positive aspect of uh, of this design. And I'd also point out that when you look at the adjoining properties, those properties that front Room Street, for instance, the, those properties are 125 feet deep as well, as is the property that adjoins us to the uh, west, which fronts on the Summit Street. That's about 150, 154 feet deep. So you can see that this block is essentially large. The lots on it are large. It does provide for the opportunity for additional open space, air light and open space, the interior of the block, uh, notwithstanding that we're asking for the rear yard variance. I think in general, you can see that this project meets the intent and purpose of the Journal Square plan. It will uh, re help to reestablish Journal Square as the primary business district by providing this type of higher density housing in close proximity to local businesses to help support local business, which is which is really the, the purpose number one. It also will make walking and biking easy, safe, and desirable through providing the bike storage and also the site's location to near, near mass transit. 
uh, also reduces auto dependency because of those same reasons. And those are purposes number five and number, number seven. Um, this project will also remove some older obsolete structures and replace these, uh, build, these buildings with and as existing surface parking as well. It replaces that with a new, uh, new uh, attractive residential mid-rise building, which is permitted. Uh, that's uh, purpose number 11. And it also provides for redevelopment without public acquisition through private uh, resubdivision and consolidation of properties. And that, that was actually accomplished by this board as Mr. Harrington pointed out before. And, and in general, this project promotes the principles of uh, smart growth, which is uh, purpose number 21. It also promotes purposes of the municipal land use law, which pretty much mirror the same things I've discussed. Uh, you know, two way promotes the uh, public good and general welfare, um, provides light air and open space to the middle of the block. Again, notwithstanding the fact that we are seeking the rear yard variance. Uh, promotes the, pop the establishment of appropriate population densities. And, you know, it's in terms of the uh, desirable visual environment and aesthetics, it's, you know, it's clear we're taking out some buildings that are older, dilapidated surface parking and providing them with a new attractive building. So we get to the variances and or deviations. And we're talking about a rather minimus height variance. It's 1.1 feet over the 60, 65 feet that are permitted will be essentially imperceptible to the, to the public. The six stories are permitted, so we're not asking for any deviation in that regard. So I think you can see that really 1.1 feet would not result in any substantial detriment to the public welfare or to the public good or to the intent of the redevelopment plan. And to the, the benefit of this project we've already discussed, and I think you can see that they would substantially outweigh any detriment. In terms of the setbacks, one is for the front yard, and because that in this zone, zone four, you look at the, um, um, the predominant. And so, as I mentioned, there are several of these older two family homes or wood frame dwellings. Um, they are being replaced though by these mid rise buildings. So if you look at the emerging character and what's been approved and re recently constructed, it's all with zero lot line. So I think that the, that the proposed setback is more in keeping with what the emerging character is going to be. So granting that deviation would not result in any substantial de uh, detriment. And again, the benefits of this project would substan substantially outweigh any of those, those detriments. In terms of the rear yard, what supports the rear yard variance really is the extraordinary depth. Um, the, uh, the idea of having a building that's set 95 feet in depth was to allow for some space at the rear of the, of the lot. In this case, even with the slightly longer building, we're still providing that same space. We're providing that same space now at uh, ground level, which I think is better than having it uh, at, at, the, at the second floor or at the top of the first floor. Um, so again, that's a better approach to design. The benefits of that would substantially outweigh any, any detriments. We're now in terms of parking, we have a parking stall width, which is about six inches, instead of uh, nine feet, it's eight and a half. <clears throat> we have uh, only five spaces. I think that the ability to be able to um, circulate within the garage and for cars to be able to maneuver will not result in a substantial detriment because of the limited number of spaces. And that that's also helps support the setback for the, of the garage door. Rather than setting the garage door back, we have it in plane with the front of the building. But because of the limited amount of traffic, limited amount of cars coming and going, there should be no, no negative impacts. And again, we've already talked about the substantial benefits of this project in terms of promoting the redevelopment plan and the redevelopment of the area. And then lastly, there is a requirement that 2% of the dwelling units be three bedroom units. In this case, that would uh, be 1.4 units. Uh, the land development ordinance provides that when you're doing these sort of uh, calculations, uh, if it's less than a half, you round down, more than a half, you round up. So in this case, that would simply be one unit. So I don't see loss of one unit being substantial detriment. And it was felt that because of the type of building that this is, providing the uh, larger family size units would not be appropriate. And notwithstanding that, the architect has mentioned, we have a, a variety of units 
uh, from studio to one bedroom, one bedroom plus den plus two bedroom units. And all of them are of reasonable size. So I think that the uh, exclusion of that one three bedroom unit would not result in any substantial detriment. And in general, the benefits of the project substantially outweigh the detriments. So in summary, uh, I think you can grant these variances, one, because of the unusual shape the, and the uh, large, uh, large, much larger depth of the property, which could be a C1 hardship case. But for most of the, the variances, I think you could also look at the benefits outweighing the detriments and grant these deviations uh, under the C2 criteria. That concludes the testimony. Okay, thank you, Mr. Colling. Um, yeah, I have no questions. Anybody else? No. Okay. Okay, that, that completes our presentation. All right, thanks, Mr. Harrington. Uh, so at this time, we'll open it up for public comment. If anybody wants to comment who's here from the public, this is your chance. Please raise your hand. If you are calling in and you'd like to comment, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Anybody from the public, please raise your hand if you'd like to comment. Seeing no public, I move to clo uh, close the public portion. Second it. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Uh, Tim, do you have anything to add? You did, Tim. Um, just that uh, in the staff report uh, dated today, um, I sent along an email to you guys just in case nobody had it, um, that um, the deviations being requested are relatively minor in nature. The, there's the constraints of the irregularly shaped lot. Um, I don't feel it negatively impacts the zone four neighborhood mixed use district or the overall intent of the redevelopment plan. Um, also that, uh, they did work with us uh, to deal with the deed restriction that was um, was found early on, and they made changes to the plan to accommodate that open space at the rear um, of the building bordering uh, one of the lots on Summit Avenue. Um, overall, I think it's a good development, and uh, uh, and Chuck, just that uh, you know, in my staff report. The staff recommended conditions upon approval as long as you have no issues with those. Um, I, I approve of the application. Yeah, those would be acceptable. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Council. Mr. Right. Chair, I'd like to make a motion at this time to approve case P20-093 as presented to the board tonight. Second. Okay. Motion made and seconded for approval. Uh, Vice Chairman Gonzalez. Good job, my vote aye. Um, Commissioner Cruz. Aye. Commissioner Gangadin. Aye. Dr. Desai. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Commissioner Torres. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Um, nice colors on the building. I vote aye. And Chairman Langston. Aye. All in favor, motion passes with staff commissions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, so the time is 7.02. Uh, this would probably be a good time to take a quick break. Um, let's do uh, 10 minutes, everybody. It's 7.02, we'll come back at 7.12.
Uh, could we bring Santo back in? For some reason, he's an attendee. He's got his hand raised. I'm from <laughs> now. Thanks, Erica. Chairman, do we want to bring him back in? I don't know. I don't know. I love it when he waves. Uh, <laughs> hey, I didn't hear anything. Hey, what's up? Do we have to pay him if we don't bring him back in? <laughs> Leave the you guys pay me? <laughs> <laughs> Stop right, telling that joke. It's getting old. <laughs> All right, it's seven twelve, everybody. Uh, let's come back to order, and we'll call item fifteen on the agenda. Is case P two zero dash one one five, a preliminary and final major site plan uh, for fifteen Park Lane South. Good evening, commissioners. Um, as you know, my name is Jim McCann. I'm here tonight representing Newport Associates Development Company. Um, the applicant tonight is requesting uh, a preliminary and final site plan approval for property um, on block 7302, lot five. The approval is for permission to construct privately owned developed and maintained publicly accessible open space on a portion of Pier 199B. Uh, for the moment, I'm gonna to defer to council um, to confirm that my notice um, is in order, my affidavit of publication and service with exhibits. Yes, yeah, so I am in receipt of the affidavit of publication proof of mailing with respect to the applicant, 15 Park Lane South. All does appear to be in order. We can mark that as A1 for the record. A1. All right, thank you, Council. Thank you. Um, commissioners, um, by way of a little background on this application, um, the applicant presented a site plan application for Pier 199B in June of 2020. Um, that application requested approval of um, publicly accessible open space, but also immediately adjacent to it, um, open space that was then intended to be private and would have been accessible only to Newport residents. Um, and also the previous application from June of 2020 um, did not contain a public access point on the southerly side of Pier 199B. This board voted not to approve that application. So Newport, went back to the drawing board and we are presenting you with a new application tonight that has two significant changes and I believe two significant concessions. Concession number one is that Newport has eliminated any request for approval of private open space for this application that would be accessible only to Newport residents. We've eliminated it completely from this application. Um, the portion of the pier where the public, where the private open space was to be as of June, 2020, will now remain undeveloped except for um, the area will be seeded with native grass to comply with Jersey City's green area ratio requirements. Um, but as state, and this area will not be accessible to either the public or to Newport residents. It will be accessible only for maintenance purposes. The second important change and concession is that Newport has agreed to a condition um, that it will consent to be placed in any resolution should the board approve tonight's application. And I'm gonna read that application into the, that condition into the record. And you can also find it in the staff, the amended staff report that was submitted tonight. 
The condition states that if the applicant develops the remainder of the property as open space, the property shall include in the development privately owned and maintained public access. The dimensions, materials, and form of public access shall be subject to the planning board's approval. The intention of this condition is to assure, assure the planning board and the planning department that if there is more open space on this pier, that it will have public access. Um, now, as far as the application before you goes tonight, um, I will stipulate for the board that construction of all improvements, if any are approved tonight, will be done and paid for by Newport. Once the pier is developed, it will be managed, operated, and maintained by Newport entities. And once opened, if this, if this open space is approved, the pier will be accessible to all members of the public free of charge, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, now, just to take care of a little bit more housekeeping, the documents that have been filed uh, for this application are civil plans prepared by Dresner Robbins last dated January 20th, 2021, landscaping site plans prepared by MNLA landscaping architects last dated January 20th, 2021, Illustrate an illustrative site plan prepared by MNLA Landscape Architects and a materials and planting sample prepared by MNLA Architects. Those documents, some portion of them will be presented to this board tonight. Uh, also filed as part of this application was a recreation and open space master plan conformance report prepared by Dresner Robin as planners. Huh and a planning report uh, for this lot prepared by Dresner Robin as planners. Um, now, there's one other housekeeping item. Um, when I noticed for this application, there was a green area ratio deviation in our application. Um, Matt Ward pointed it out. After consultation with Newport, we elected to eliminate that guard deviation from the application. So the plans that you will see tonight will not have that deviation in it. And we will explain to you how we believe we have eliminated that deviation. Uh, tonight's presentation will consist mostly of colorized versions of the filed plans and a colorized photo uh, taken uh, or submitted with this application. Um, just as another housekeeping item, there are two city reports. One is from Jersey City Engineering and one is from um, Planning Department staff. At the end of the presentation, I would like to discuss a handful of the conditions um, in, in those reports. So uh, I would request that the chairman or the assistant chairman keep that in mind and give me a moment to do that. As far as our application tonight, we have three witnesses, Matt Knowles of Dresdner Robbins as the civil engineer, Dan Yannacone of MNLA Landscape Architects as the landscape architect and Charles Height of Dresdner as the professional planner. Um, having given that introduction, I will call my first witness, Matt Knowles. Okay, thank you, council. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Could you state and spell your full name for the record? Sure. It's Matthew Newells, uh, M-A-T-T-H-E-W. Last name is N-E-U-L-S. Thank you. And, and Jim, just before we get started with Mr. Knowles and, and getting his qualifications, I uh, listened to your entire opening, obviously, and obviously my only concern at this point is any potential issue of race judicata. So I understand, and, and for everybody's edification out there in Zoom land, uh, that's a concept about this having already been decided and whether or not this application is substantially different 
then the prior application that was denied. So counsel, as I understand it, uh, and it seems to me that it is substantially different. What I would ask that you explain before your witnesses provide that testimony just for purposes of the record is, my recollection of the June application was the, what I'll refer to as the exterior walkway along the river with the infill field being uh, only for the Newport residents, as you as you stated, are we talking about not developing that interior portion at this point? We are the the interior portion will not be developed. There will be no privately accessible open space on that area. However, the area will be seeded with native grass to comply with. Um, Jersey City's green area ratio requirements. But will it be accessible or you can't traverse over to it? It will not be accessible privately or publicly. Okay. It will be accessible only for maintenance of the, the undeveloped land area, which will be necessary from time to time, I believe. And okay, Mr. Chairman, from, from a legal standpoint, as far as whether or not the application is substantially different, uh, I find that it is. I find that it's a different application. There's a significant enough change that it can be brought and heard by the board. Uh, and we will see and hear the testimony and the board will, will make its decision. Thank you, Council. Uh, Mr. McCann, I think uh, Santo cut you off there. Were you going to add something? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mr. Newells. <laughs> um, has Matt been, I forget, has Matt been sworn and, and uh, qualified? Uh, he was not qualified. I don't recall. He was sworn and not qualified. Okay, he was sworn. Okay, Mr. Newells, uh, we've qualified you before you were uh, part of the last application for this this um, area, block and lot number. Uh, is your license current tonight? In this yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Matt, you're the civil engineer for, um, for the project that's before the board tonight, correct? That's right. And um, in your capacity as civil engineer, you have, uh, have you reviewed the Newport redevelopment plan? Yes. And have you also, because this project involves waterfront development permit issues, have you, all, or have you also reviewed and are you familiar with the uh, NJDEP uh, waterfront development permit requirements? Yes. Yes, I am. And, and when you prepared the civil plans for this application, did you take both the Newport redevelopment plan and the waterfront development permit uh, requirements into consideration for compliance purposes? Yes. Okay. Uh, so Matt, can you pull up um, the first slide from our presentation? Okay. Now, Matt, this is a photograph that we filed with our application, correct? That's right. Um, and so can you explain to the board um, and authenticate this photograph for us? Sure. Uh, so the photograph is a, is a near map satellite image. Uh, the image was taken actually in September of 2020. It is the latest one available on the, on the website. Uh, in terms of uh, authenticating it, I did visit the site actually today just to uh, make sure that the conditions are relatively the same and the snow snow cover notwithstanding, uh, I don't see any differences. So I think this is pretty accurate. Okay, thank you. And now can you explain to the board what actually this photograph shows about the application? I sure can. Uh, and the plant proposal. Sure, uh, so, so we're on pointing right now for those uh, who can see the screen. 
is is the site generally speaking it's it's known as lot five and block 7302 and the site that we're talking about in particular is pure 199b which is a part of it it's the larger part of it the more rectangular sort of part of that part of that landform there um, and that's the location of the site if you look at the top of the screen it's the uh, the Hudson Bergen light rail Hoboken terminal station to, to, to the north of the screen, you'll see the Hudson River waterfront walkway along the water. On the very left edge of the screen for people's, uh, just to, to orient people is the Target store. And you have Washington Boulevard running up and down along the left side of the image there to give you an idea of where we are located. And Matt, just two more things. The, the ellipse site is, is in this picture also, is it not? Correct, They're directly adjacent to Pier 199B here, right where I'm uh, pointing now. And then the other part um, that's jutting out to the south, um, explain that to the board quickly. This, this piece here that I'm pointing at is, is part of the lot that we're here to talk about tonight, but it's a separate pier. Uh, the lot is actually broken into two separate piers, which are separate structures. Just, just to be clear, you don't see the change on the ground, but they are two separate structures on the same property. Okay. Uh, can you take us to the next slide, Matt? Sure. Here we go. Okay, so this is a this next slide is really has the same image as the background, but what we've done is gone ahead and highlighted certain features, and I'll just go through certain ones I, I mentioned and others I, I didn't. So uh, at the top of the screen again, it's the Hoboken Terminal, and that's where the, the Hudson Bergen Light Rail Station part of the terminal. Uh, I've highlighted the Hudson River waterfront walkway here in red. And so that just shows you where the walkway runs. It runs around the ellipse. And I'll get into that. The reason why that is in a, in a few minutes uh, continues along to the south of the site. I've highlighted the location of the Pier 199B project site, which is what we're here to discuss this evening. Also Newport Green, uh, which is uh, it's open space to, just to the west of the project site. And I've highlighted Washington Boulevard again, running north and south along the left side of my screen uh, and the River Market Plaza a little bit further south along uh, River Drive, just to give some, again, some context of where, where things are located. This is Newport Parkway running east and west along the bottom of the screen. here. This uh, exhibit wasn't uh, distributed to the board. Can we mark it, please? Yes, um, thank you. Okay, that will be eight. And Matt, how about that highlight, the overview, the bird's eye view without the markings? I believe that was in the, the package. Okay. That was. So this will be A2 for the record. And Matt, just Matt, uh, Matt Knowles, just to be clear that this, this is a colorized, uh, the same photo that we just showed that was part of the application, but it's colorized um, and marked up to, uh, uh, as a tool to explain where we are to the board, correct? That's a, exactly correct. Yeah, okay. We, 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 we've and added the be, markups to it to the image. Just to be clear, the waterfront walkway that's marked in orange, that all of that is already completed, correct, and accessible to the public? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Matt. Mr. McCann, if, if I may, just to, to help the board, the highlighted green portion around the pier that looks like a upside down U, correct? That's what the little hand is, is showing. Is that the same dimensions as it was in June? Uh, I think I think we need I need would need Matt to answer that question if he can or or the landscape architect in, when he gets to his testimony. I mean, yeah, I I'm just it, trying to I'm just trying to help the board understand if if that's the same or different than what was proposed back in the June application as far as that pathway. At, are we calling it a waterfront walkway? Well, we're not. It's actually a peer. It's a peer development. So we're not calling it a waterfront walkway because that would give the wrong impression. But that's why I asked it that way, Council. Right. 
So can we defer on that on that question for the time being? We we will certainly get back to it. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, Matt, next slide, please. Okay, so this this next slide is is just just for reference purposes. Again, this is the the cover sheet of the drawings that we submitted. So this is just the, the very front page of the of the drawings. I don't know if there's any questions with this one, or if I can just move to the next the next, next slide. Next slide, Matt. Okay. okay. So. So this slide that I have up here is a copy of the uh, the site plan drawing that we did submit to the board, C301, except again, we've added some coloration, some notes to help with the presentation here tonight. So just to point out a number of things that are on here. So Matt, take us through the, uh, take us through the improvements. Okay, so, um, so if you look at some of the underlying, uh, let me just go through one by one. Our, our uh, our proposed development has a couple different elements here. Uh, we have a, a walkway, a walkway along the northern side of the pier. We have a, a waterward uh, plaza, which is a plaza along the, the water's edge, essentially the eastern edge of the pier. And then there's a landward plaza uh, shown here. So the, um, the walkway is a required element for developments on piers for the DEP. And so what we've gone and done is highlighted the required 16 foot wide public access walkway based on the, the state's peer development requirements. Uh, we've highlighted the minimum, the 16 foot dimension is highlighted in red. As you can see, as you go along the walkway, uh, part particularly in the right-hand area, the walkway is wider than that, but I wanted to just highlight in red what, what the required dimension is so that you can see what's, what's required by the walls. The walkway does continue. It splits up down here around an, an art plaza. Uh, and uh, that's the walkway element. To the right in the blue is the waterward plaza or the waterward open space element that's required for peer developments. The minimum dimension of that is, is 20 feet. We have a hardscape plaza that varies from about 23 feet at its narrowest to, to over 30 feet in many areas. Additionally, there's landscape areas to the left of that, uh, which are included in the waterward open space. But again, the blue is provided to, to give you a reference as what's the minimum required width for that, width for that element. And over to the left uh, in the uh, orange highlighting is the landward open space. It's, it's the, the minimum required is, is a 20 foot wide strip. What we've done is rearrange that to, to make sense, and that's permitted under the rules to rearrange into a different shape, provided you have the minimum width. And uh, that consists of a deck and overlook area, which will be explained by another witness. Uh, also, a dog, a dog run area, which will be accessible through the Hudson River waterfront walkways. It's a publicly accessible dog run for folks to use there. And then there's a connection area between the Hudson River waterfront walkway, which is in this white shading to the left of the site. Uh, that's the connection point between the pier walkway and the Hudson River waterfront walkway in that location. This um, is of interest here, and I, and I think I just touched on this when we have this, this slide up here, is that this is the, uh, the 1931 modified bulkhead line. And that was a line that was established you know, over a century ago and then modified several times. But that was the limit that people or entities were allowed to fill in uh, uh, waters back in when the railroads were uh, building out their systems. And so that really shows the delineation between the ellipse, which is on land, and the site, which is which is a pier. So I just wanted to highlight that. that. That is a regulatory boundary and a structural, an actual boundary between a structure and, and full depth uh, land that had been built, filled in. So, so Matt, just, just to summarize a little bit. So the the white on the left side of this drawing is actually the ellipse that was approved and constructed. And it was it was approved and constructed with a portion of the waterfront walkway, correct? That's right. And you can see the waterfront walkway here kind of making this backward sort of C shape here around the site. And the, and the ellipse is on land. That's right. Okay, and, and the land is everything to the left of the red boundary. That's correct. Uh, except there is water here and here below that yep. projection of land. But but yes, this this area is is a projected uh, land. 
Thank you. And the area that's in gray to the to the right of that uh, uh, on the pier, that is actually um, was approved as part of the ellipse, correct? That is correct. That was approved as part of the ellipse and it provides uh, the truck access to to this. Where I'm pointing here is actually a loading area for ellipse. So trucks can access ellipse and that was approved back in uh, 2015 with the ellipse project. Okay, so then everything to the right of the red line is is Pier 199B, correct? That's right. And the uh, reason it's a the reason it's a pier is because the DEP has a definition um, of what a pier is. Can you tell the board what that is? Yes, I can. A pier is a is a the definition that they have is a pile supported decked decked structure extending from upland over water. And another part of that is that the longest axis of a pier is generally perpendicular to the shoreline, meaning you know it, it's oriented. It projects out like in this way, not not something more parallel to the shore. So this is a deck structure, meaning there's a deck, uh, a, a timber deck underneath, uh, underneath the land here. It's not land underneath the, the soil, and then uh, the, that's supported by timber piles that are driven into the riverbed. So there's you know, there's water under that. So according to the DEP, Pier 199B is in fact a pier, not land. That's correct. Okay. All right. And and this design that we're we're proposing tonight, again, and we did mention it in June 2020, but it complies with all the requirements of the NJDEP for the development of a pier, correct? That's correct. And so and it, and it is not required to have a public access point on the southerly side of the pier, according to the DEP rules and regulations, correct? No, that's correct. The DEP rules require a single a single 16 foot wide public access walkway and, and they do not specify where on the pier that is placed. That They only require that it connect from the waterward open space, which is blue, to the spot where it abuts the Hudson River waterfront walkway which is just at the upper left corner of the site where I'm pointing. Okay. And at the top of that picture, everything in green and everything in red is, is if this application is approved, will be accessible for public use, correct? That's correct. Everything in, in green, red, blue, and orange will all be accessible. Okay. Um, now let's, let's explain to the board the difference between the June 2020 application and the present application. And, and I believe the area that we wanna focus on is the white area, correct? Yes. And the white area as of June, 2020, that is generally the area that we Newport had previously proposed as privately accessible open space for Newport residents, correct? That's right. Okay. And now, We've eliminated all of those improvements from this application. And basically what we're asking the board to approve is for this area to be seeded with native grass, correct? That's right, that's exactly right. And the purpose of the native grass is because it's, it, uh, it complies with the GAR requirements, yes? That's right. And, it, um, and it's sustainable design. It is. It's sustainable design. It covers it covers the ground, and it and it and it like, it, it, like you indicated, it does comply with the GAR requirements and provides credit in that regard. Okay, and commissioners, um, this is the part where I, I I believe the condition that Newport has agreed to is important because this is the area where, if and when Newport develop it develops it. Um, the, the condition would apply and, and there will be, according to the condition, uh, a public access in this area when it is developed subject to the board's approval. Um, Mr. McCann, can you explain what that means? Public access is the entire pier going to be available for the public? No, that, that's not what the condition means. The, the condition means that if there's more open space, there will be public access available. Um, 
Newport, so, so Newport does not at the present time know or have any plan to develop the remainder of the site, the area in white. But we want the board to know that there will be public access on that area. I can't say at this time, because that's up to the board and Newport to work on in the future, but there will be public access there. The dimensions of it, the means of access, it's all included in the condition will be subject to the board's approval because well, the applicant we, wants the planning department and the board to be part of any future development on this site. So I just wanna be clear that it is possible that there will only be a portion of the white area that would be accessible and available in the future to the public. It is possible. It is also possible that the entire area could be accessible to the public. And tonight's application includes no access for the public to any of the white area. Or anybody else. And no access to Newport residents either. It's an area that will be seeded with native grass and it will be available for viewing as part of as part of the improved open space on the pier. And it will actually be restricted area vis-a-vis -vis a fence and a gate. Yes, and, and you will see that when the landscape architect makes his presentation. I just wanted to be clear. Thank you, Mr. McCann. Hey, Council, is that uh, is that your testimony for Mr. Knowles? Matt, is that is that the end of your slide presentation? Yeah, I think I think it is. The next slide uh, covers the next topic. So. Before we jump to the next slide, uh, we just should mark this one as well with the notes on it now. And um, while this slide is up, can we just uh, can I sent you an, a staff email when this amended plan was submitted? showing the native grass area to just change from no public access to no access. Ah, Matt, that's a great point. Mr. McCann, I was actually going to say that because on your, on your slides there, it says public, no public access, but yeah. want to make sure that it's not for private yeah. residents either. The applicant will agree to, uh, to, to change that note to say no access um, I think just to be careful, we probably should say also maintenance access only. Is that is that acceptable? I'm fine with that. Yes. Yeah, yeah I agree. And and uh, Bridget, so this is Mark A3. It's uh, the site plan exhibit with uh, colorized callouts. Hey, A3 and Jim, uh, A2 and A3, you will send uh, the marked copies to Matt to the office. And to me too, after the hearing. Uh, certainly. Thank you. Okay. Um, any Commissioner Lanston, I have a question for McCann. Should we exit later on after the landscape or can we exit now? Um, no, I mean, if you want to ask it now and we'll see, we'll see where it goes. Mr. McCann, um, in your open statement, you said the uh, condition for the open area that's going to be with the native grass, if it, the condition ever changes to private or public um, use is what you said. Um, it will be either one in the future, so it could be private and public. No, no, Commissioner. Um, I think what, what, I, what I said or certainly meant to say, is that it will be privately owned and privately maintained. So Newport okay. will continue to maintain that area um, into the future, but it but it will have public access. 
So basically, my concern is that it's not going to be a couple of years down the line that we get a small section of it for the public and it becomes private again, the other section. That could happen. That could happen. But it would have Please. to come to the board? Yes, yes, Commissioner. What, what we're agreeing to is anything we do with the remainder of the space, the white area on this exhibit, will be subject to the board's approval. It, it oh. is already. Thank it you is for the already. clarification. Thank yep. you for the clarification. Sure. But we're saying that that could be private in the future? That's what I'm they're not, saying. You know, I'm not really saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to really ensure the board that um, whatever is developed there as open space will have public access. I, I, I can't at this point. The, the reason we added the, 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 um, to the condition, the dimensions, materials, and form will be subject to the planning board's approval is to make sure that this board and the planning department would absolutely positively have a strong say in whatever it is that gets developed and approved there. Mm. But you're, you're saying that it'll have public access. Yes. But at the si same time, you're saying that it could be private access only. I think what I'm saying is I, I can't say how much. I, I can't even say that it'll have private access. What I'm, what I'm trying to say that it will have public access, that is a condition that we're agreeing to. But exactly what it will look like at this point will have to be discussed with planning as part of planning department, as part of a conversation, and it will absolutely have to be approved by this board. Well, and while we can all appreciate that, Mr. McCann, I guess the, the struggle for the board is we've got a controlled access gate controlled by Newport, and we're talking about an open space that Yes, maybe if they want to construct a structure or something like that, that makes it a little more uh, within the board. But who's to say that there isn't a key card to the gate allowing only uh, the Newport residents to that area? I think that's the sensitivity of the board. That is, and, that is council. And the concern. Yep. And I think that was one of the concerns back in June is... You know. my concern. Mine too. Well, this board has already sent a very strong message to Newport that any kind of a key access of that kind is not going to be approved by the board. That was the message that, that we got in June of 2020 and was taken into consideration. I think the issue here is Newport is can't commit and is not ready to say that it's developing anything on the southern portion of the lot, but we'd like to develop the northern portion and the waterwood portion because it, it's publicly accessible open space and Newport's planned on developing it, you know, currently. So, so, so Mr. McCann, in all candor, uh, I guess what I don't understand is why the native grass seeded area is not accessible in the native grass state. I don't think we're looking for gazebos and, and everything else in that area, but why can't people go in there and throw a football around and play Frisbee, et cetera, et cetera? Well, there are a lot of things that go along with that. There's, there's maintenance issues, there's safety issues, um, there's work that will have to be done on the southern end of the pier in order to make it um, converted into a manner that's safe for people to be on. And that's not something that Newport is currently um, proposing to do. Um, that's why we're asking that the southerly section remain undeveloped at the present time, except for the native grass. 
But Mr. McCann, what you're saying is that native grass can be planted now and that you have the, your, your client has the uh, uh, ability to remove those native grasses whenever they decide they want to, uh, for whatever reason they want to. They have to come to the board, obviously, is what you've said, but they can plant native grasses with no access um, and we're going to change that to no public or private access, but then they can remove the native grasses later on. That, that's kind of how it stands. Well, only with the board's approval, though. Right. If, if, if the native grass is part of this application, then it has to stay that way until we come back for an amended site plan approval. Okay. We, we stipulate that. Council, I'm just getting hung up on on the future private access. It, it's just, it sounds like we're not, you know, in one aspect, we're committing to it being public access if it's ever improved. But at the same time, we're still keeping that private access aspect of it. And, and I, I, don't, I don't see where that comes in. I, I'm not, I'm really not doing that. I'm really trying to neither commit Newport nor the board at this time to either circumstance. It sounds, you know, we can't commit to the entire site at this point being public open space because there are other things that need to be done with the pier before that can happen, other work that needs to be done before anything can be developed there. So what we're trying to say is we're not committing to developing anything. We're not eliminating the possibility of anything, but we're asking about where we are committing to public access in dimensions, materials, and a form that this board will approve. Okay, so it's safe to say that any future improvements on the southern portion that's marked in white currently, that area will be accessible to the public. No, he's not saying that. He's not saying that. He's <laughs> I'm saying some or all of it might be. <laughs> might be. <laughs> Subject to the board's approval. Mr. Mr. McCann, you keep saying the safety, Newport would have to have the safety of the area. Uh, if it was to go public, there's a lot of stuff they need to do in the southern end of, the, of that uh, section. But as of right now, when they plant the natural grass, maintenance people and machinery will be cutting the grass on the southern portion. Wouldn't you consider that safe then? Or is well, it an unsafe condition for the workers to work on that natural grass? But, but Commissioner, there's a big difference between Newport having its maintenance people who, who are trained. To and, work on something dangerous. Well, I'm not saying it's dangerous or not, but there's a big difference between that and preparing a site for regular and repeated um, public use, um, it, it, there, there's, there has to be a much higher standard to get a site ready for repeated public use, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I, I would hope you would concede that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about a, a manicured lawn. We're talking about you know, I would assume, and I'll, I'll wait for the landscape architect to testify, but it, I'm assuming it's some kind of seagrass that's, you know, that's what I think of a native grass rather than a, a manicured area. Right. Yes. And we're well, not. So chairman, chairman, I think that the landscape architect can address, and again, in layman's terms, how or what would be necessary, I guess for the native grass area to be a quote unquote safe open field for members of the public or anybody for that matter. Even the, even the but, maintenance. But Mr. McCann, I guess the, 
the struggle is, it's one thing if Newport does not want to commit to not developing the pier with, say, a building of some sort. That I can appreciate, that I can understand, right? If it's possible to develop a building on the pier and in the future they want to make an application to develop a building on the pier, that I get. My, my brain can comprehend it. What my brain can't comprehend is how Newport is unwilling to commit that any open space on that pier will be accessible to the public, period. Exactly, Council. Thank you, Council. Mr. McCann, anything? So, um, you know, we're, we're not committing to building, a, to, to constructing a building on the site. We're, we're just not. The, the entire site could someday be subject to, and it could be publicly, a, publicly accessible open space. But there might be a building on the site. There might be some portion of the undeveloped site that is dedicated to public use. I, I can't say, I'm not, I'm not trying to, um, and Newport is not trying here to um, create, create an avenue for privately accessible open space. That's, that's not what we're trying to do. And even if we were, we would still have to come back to this board and have it approved. What we're really trying to, to, to say is there will be public access to open space that's developed on that site. So Mr. McCann- In the future, if and when. So Mr. McCann, can we say that any open space on the pier will be open to the public? Any open space, or we can't go that far. But you're you're requiring us to commit right now that if we develop more open space, the entire thing has to be publicly accessible. That is that what you're asking me? What I'm asking is if you develop any more open space on that pier, that it is open to the public as well. Any open space. Right, meaning every square foot of open space is is accessible to the public. Correct. Yes. Uh, if we can continue the presentation, I I can discuss it with the client. But um, the idea here was really to keep an open door for the planning department and the planning board to um, continue discussions regarding this space, not to commit to anything in connection with this space other than it will have public access. Well, so I, I, I think Mr. McCann, what the board wants is the board wants to know that any open space developed in the future is open fully to the public. I will grant you the right, so to speak, to make an application in the future to put a building. I get all of that. I don't think the board has an issue with that and is not trying to foreclose the applicant from bringing such an application. I understand the applicant is not willing to commit the entire peer to passive recreational space. I think we can all appreciate that. But I do think that the board does not want open space that is not available to the public at large if and when it is developed. I think that's pretty clear at this point. Yes. But doesn't, but doesn't have this, doesn't the board have the full power and authority to just deny hypothetically any application that came back to it that way in the future? Of course it does. I believe we do, but I'll, I'll defer to council. Yeah. I believe that it already the, has. It, it's already done that in June of 2020. So, Mr. McCann, as, as I mean, as as a chairman, as, I mean, as a vice chair, as a commissioner who's been on this board for a long time, 
it's all about small wins. We have that power. We do have that power. Yes. But, but we, and we exercised it with you back in June with your client. But the, that's not the question. What we want is for you to, to, to do even more than what you're doing right now. The way you're presenting this and the way you're saying it, and maybe I'm wrong, but you know the commissioners can, can chime in. I, I'm not feeling comfortable with it. I'm not. I'm telling you that right now. I, I don't feel that your verbiage is, is giving us the ability to have that. If you say to us, any open space, that you further develop there will be fully open to the public, I am a go. I'm fine. I, I'll listen to the, the rest of the, the application and the presentation, and I can understand that. But if you're not willing to say that any open space in the future will be fully open to the public, we're back to square one back in June. Because the reason we didn't app uh, approve this application back in June was because you guys were limiting access to the public. And that spot right there is a continuum of, of the green spot of people who run and jog and walk and bike. And that needs to be open fully to the public. That is our issue. That is my issue. I don't know how many of the uh, commissioners agree with that. Okay. I totally agree with Vice Chair on, on the same issue. I have a problem of the same as well. So Mr. McCann, you said you discussed with your client while the landscape presentation is, is on. Uh -huh. Why don't we, uh, why don't we do that? Why don't we move on with the presentation? And, you know, let's see what the, the verbiage is after that. Okay. Uh, okay, next, uh, my next witness, um, Dan, are you out there? Yeah. Could you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And could you state and spell your full name, please? Daniel Yannacone, Y-A-N-N-A-C-C-O-N-E. Thank you. Good evening, sir. And uh, your license is current tonight in the state of New Jersey? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. You're qualified. Okay, hey, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Dan, just one second before you uh, start sure. your presentation. Uh, you're the landscape architect for the project um, that's before the board tonight? Correct. A and in that capacity, you prepared the plans that have been filed with the planning department are being and are being presented to the board tonight? Yes. And you're also familiar with the Newport Redevelopment Plan? Yes. And the NJDEP um, regulations that uh, are applicable to the peer? Yes. And you've taken them in, all into consideration in um, preparing the plans that are being presented to the board tonight, correct? Correct. Okay. Can you describe this first slide to us? Yes, this is the illustrative site plan for the uh, peer 129B. And, uh, this, and is Dan, this plan is part of the application that was filed with the board, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Newport, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Pier 1 and 9B is, has been, one second, sorry. Uh, this was designed to be a balance to Newport Green. As many of you know, Newport Green is a very programmed space for activity. On the west side of Newport Green, there's a multi-purpose field. There's a playground, uh, gardens, water park, uh, the carousel, um, viewing lawn, as well as an urban beach. So it's heavily programmed for active use. This was designed to be a balance to that, a passive space that's serene and to be a reflective experience over the water. The concept behind this was to be a kind of a nod towards the history of, of, the, of the pier and the area as an industrial site with a rail yard and a heavy green timber tr or trestle on there as well on the north edge. Also, it's something where we want to um, also be respectful of the native New Jersey coastal vegetation, which is incorporated within the planting design. Along the western edge, along the Hudson River waterfront walkway, uh, there are a couple of amenities. One is a dog run, which has a planted buffer between its, the dog runners and the uh, driveway turnaround. On the south end is a deck overlook with a few uh, shade or trees with and planters. 
seating opportunities, as well as a viewing deck over looking over looking lower Manhattan. As we, I'd like to start with at the northwest corner, uh, where the what if, where the walkway is along the edge. This walkway is something where we wanted to be an extension, kind of an extension for the Hudson River waterfront walkway. And the geometry for this was based on for the, some of the paving bands was based on some of the rail yard uh, tracks that would run through there. So some of the intersecting and, and diagonal types of bands running through that plaza. On either side of the pod, of that walkway is our planted areas. On the north edge, there's planters with alcoves of benches that provide intimate seating opportunities as well as viewing, viewing areas overlooking the pile field just north of it, as well as the Hoboken Ferry Terminal. As we move, keep moving east, we come across the Art Plaza. When the, when the center is an art piece surrounded by planting, and the area opens up with seatings along the, the very northeast corner, and a few overlook decks, or they're cantilevered over the water, again, for viewing opportunities of looking across the Manhattan and back towards Hoboken. Uh, Mr. Yannacone. Yes. Uh, just to, to move it along, is there anything about the walkway and the planting areas along the walkway and art plaza that is different from the June application, materials-wise, vegetation-wise? Uh, they're all pretty similar. Uh, I know that the, let's say that the waterfront walk or waterfront plaza, the very south end, the plaza area is a little bit larger. Okay. Same materials being proposed again? Uh, down at the south end, there's also, I'm sorry, along the backside of the water, on the west edge of the waterfront plaza, we've included a gabion wall, which is a caged uh, type of cage that you place in rumbled stone. And those, again, we've provided some seating opportunities along that edge. Okay. Uh, I think the board would like to shift back to some of the questions the board had regarding the, I guess it's native grass area, what is entailed in developing that with the native grass. Is there grading proposed there? Is there grading sure. that has to take place to prep that area? Well, I think Jim, you're on you're muted. Oh, yeah, Jimmy, you're on mute, James. No, I'm sorry. I thought Mr. McCann was talking, and I yes, I am trying to talk. I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, Council, can 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 Dan finish his presentation, and then we can ask you can the board can ask as many questions it would as it would like, please. I'm I'm going to allow him to finish his presentation, but I, I think we need to get to what the board is is concerned about. I I, I think the board likes the waterfront plaza, the art plaza, we, we like and appreciate all that. We want to talk about the issue, but continue. So I, I guess, Chairman, is that, is that, um, is that the, the board's feeling? I, I think so. I, I think we're all satisfied with, you know, the waterfront plaza, the walkway. Um, you know, what I'm getting from the board is, uh, you know, the sticking point is the, the native grass area that's, that's going to be, um, closed off for public access right now. Um, okay, well then, can I make a suggestion, please? Sure, I mean, by no means am I, you know, restricting your witness from testifying. Oh, no, I'm not suggesting that, but maybe what we should do is, I would appreciate it if the board could take a five minute break because I don't think it's appropriate for me to be off screen talking to my client while my witness is testifying without my full attention. So um, to get to the crux of the matter, if we took a five minute break or maybe a 10 minute break, we might be able to come back and resolve what appears to be the major issue for the application at this point. Does that seem like a good idea to everybody? Sure, council, do you want 10? 10 is good, thank okay. you. We'll come back at uh, 821. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you.
Yes. And, and, yeah.
What's up, Eddie? What's up, Eddie? How are you, Mr. Cruz? Everything good with you? Can't complain, can't complain. How about you? When you come here to get some papelio de carne con la capufia. Well, get me a ca café con leche. Yeah. There you go. Where's your wife? I didn't see her today. Busy, busy, busy at work, man. Ooh. Well, I got to get my coffee from somewhere else. I can't go to the Heights. <laughs> <laughs> Try to find some parking. <laughs> yeah, parking's never that bad. I think today will probably be an early night. That way. Yeah, you'll be home before 11.30. <laughs> I told my wife 9 o'clock. James is going to keep us here the longest. Oh, you got to learn. <laughs> I, I, I made that mistake in the beginning when I first joined. Lying to your wife? We got one case. We got one more case. Be home soon. That will last an hour and a half, two hours. <laughs> In the environment, where well, I'm a commission environment, it's only from say six to eight. We're done. You guys thought we'd get through the full agenda tonight? Mm -hmm. We got full the last time, that's two weeks ago. <laughs> Oh boy. Are we uh are we ready to go? Do we have everybody? We're good. Is Bridget on? I'm here. Okay. okay. Come to order again, everybody. It's 822. I lied. Ready. Uh commissioners, it's Jim McCann again on behalf of the applicant. Yes. Um I have um I'm going to make a request. Uh, I'm going to ask if the board will permit us to adjourn this application for the evening, continue it at the next hearing so that my client has a little bit more time to consider what I believe is the board's concern about the undeveloped area of the project. We'd like to very seriously take that, con that, that concern under consideration. And I believe at this point, if we resolve that, the rest of the application will probably go smoothly. So um, if the board would uh, be gracious, uh, gracious enough to permit us to do that, I would appreciate it. I think it uh, might eventually speed things along. Yeah, I think we're on the same page there. So uh, yeah, let's... Um... Let's carry with testimony taken. Um, right now, we'll call it a date certain, March 9th. Yes, that, that would be acceptable. Council, um, I don't believe there's any problem suspending testimony in the middle and then continuing it at a next hearing. Do you? I have no issue with it, Council. Okay. And All Council, right. your, your client uh, through you is clear, obviously, as to what the, that concern is about any access being open to the public, any future access. We, we are clear regarding the commissioner's concerns in, in regard to the public access, yes. Okay, good. Okay, excellent. Uh, do we need a motion to carry council? You can take a motion. Okay. Sure. Well, then at this time, I'd like to make a motion to carry P uh, case P two zero dash one one five to a date cer uh, certain of March uh, 9th, twenty twenty one. Second. 
Okay, motion made and seconded. Could I have a roll call please to carry? Motion. Uh, we have the motion. There's a roll call. Yeah, we need the roll call from somebody. I'm sorry. I thought I was unmuted. Uh, on a motion to uh, carry with preservation of motives, Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Cruz. Aye. Commissioner Torres. <laughs> Commissioner Torres, you're on mute if you. Uh, uh, aye. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Desai. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Commissioner Ganganen. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Aye. Motion carries. This will be a uh, matter will be moved to March 9th. Testimony. Thank you. And to the members of the public, there will be no further notice of this application. If you receive notice in the mail regarding this application, it is going to be continued at the March 9th hearing. You will not get any further notice. This is your notice. So March 9th for the continuation of this application. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to item 17 on our agenda. Case P20-155 is a preliminary and final major site plan with C variances for 198 Academy Street. Good evening, Chairman Langston, Commissioners. Um, if you could promote Mark Chisvet and Stuart Johnson and Ed Colling, Absolutely. those will be my witnesses on the application this evening. Got it. My name is Donald Pepe from the law firm of Scorinci Hollenbeck. I'm here on behalf of the applicant Vaishnoma Summit Urban Renewal LLC. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Alampi, I've submitted affidavits of publication and copies of my notices. Uh, I'd submit that the board has jurisdiction to hear this application. I ask you to confirm that. Thank you, Council. I am going to receive the affidavit of publication proof of mailing with respect to the application at 198 Academy Street here in the city. All does appear to be in order. We're going to mark those as A1 for the record. Jurisdiction is proper before this board. Thank you. So uh, we are at uh, block 12301, lot two, and that is 168 Academy, as noted. We're here this evening seeking preliminary and final site plan approval with two C deviations, one with respect to the minimum ceiling floor height on the ground floor, and one with respect to the rear yard requirement. Uh, we had previously presented this application to the CAP committee, uh, the Journal Square CAP committee back in November. Um, and we, we did not receive any negative feedback from them. The property is rather large in area. It's close to 30,000 square feet. We're in zone four, the neighborhood mixed use district of the Journal Square 2060 redevelopment plan. And we are proposing an 18 story mixed use residential commercial building. So I have three witnesses. Mark Shizvet is our civil, but I'm going to keep him, re him in reserve in case the board has any questions for him. I think that the civil aspects of this are relatively straightforward and are um, apparent from our application itself. I think it probably, uh, to keep things moving along, we'll go right to our architectural testimony. And for that tonight, I have Stuart Johnson from Minnow and Wasco. Okay, thank you, Council. Yeah, if, uh, if anybody has any questions along the way for Mr. Chisbet, he's uh, available. I don't see Mr. Johnson, Don. Am I missing him? Uh, Stuart. I'm promoting him. Okay. Sorry, Erica. Right. No worries. <clears throat> Hi, Mr. Johnson. Raise your right hand to be sworn. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, yes, I do. Could you state and spell your full name for the record? Sure. Uh, Stuart Johnson, S-T-U-A-R-T, 
uh, last name Johnson, J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, good evening. Uh, we've qualified you in the past. Your license is current tonight? Yes, it is, and you have. Okay, thank you. You're qualified then. Thank you. Stuart, if you could uh, share your screen and take the board through the uh, architectural aspects of the application. I'd be happy to. Great. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. We can. Yes. Okay. Great. I'm going to advance the slide here to sheet uh, A00. Um, it's my pleasure to be here this evening on behalf of the applicant to uh, present this uh, this application for a new mixed-use 18-story development. Uh, the site is located within the Journal Square 2060 redevelopment plan. Uh, specifically, it's located within the Zone Four and qualifies for a, a quarter bonus site. Um, as uh, Mr. Pepe had uh, noted, uh, the site is located within the northwest corner of uh, Summit Avenue and Academy Street. Uh, it's a irregular shaped lot that has through frontage onto Rock Street as well. So the site technically has a frontage on three streets, um, Academy Street to the south, uh, Summit Street to the west, and a partial frontage on Rock Street to the north. Uh, the lot existing today is partially developed with an existing six-story, 69-unit residential apartment building uh, on the eastern portion of the site um, and it, the uh, western portion of the site here uh, with frontage on the corner of Summit and Academy is uh, the application before this board this evening. Uh, it is an existing surface parking lot uh, that is being used as a surface parking lot today with an existing curb cut along Summit Avenue. So again, as proposed, the development uh, uh, or the application being considered uh, before the, this board this evening is for a new mixed use 18 story residential building uh, consisting of ground floor uh, residential lobby, uh, a small office lobby and small uh, retail space, uh, two levels of office space on <laughs> levels two and three, and uh, 15 levels of residential above. Uh, the project is 198 feet in building height which complies with the permitted building height with the applicable bonuses. Um, with that, I'll advance the slide. So again, the uh, developable area is, uh, or, or the lot area is this red highlighted area. Uh, if we advance the slide here, this is sheet A01. This is a color rendered uh, ground floor plan, which matches that that was previously submitted uh, to the board. Uh, and, and this provides the ground floor of the building. So as shown, uh, the site is a corner lot uh, that has frontage on Summit and Academy. Uh, the ground floor uses consist of a residential lobby. Uh, these are the areas that are pocheted in the yellow color, uh, providing an active use and elegant storefront windows, which, which wrap the corner from Summit Avenue to that of Academy. Uh, also a office lobby adjacent to the residential lobby and a small retail space of approximately 860 square feet on the ground floor. Uh, the other uses on the ground floor consist of uh, the residential lobby, uh, the mail room, uh, package for the residential community, as well as a, uh, a, a Wi-Fi lounge and, and uh, co-working lounge for residents of the community. Again, uh, here at the ground floor uh, with storefront windows that, that uh, wrap the corner and begin to activate that facade. Uh, we've smartly designed the mechanical spaces in the back of house program to generally be screened from view. Uh, so the, the areas pocheted in darker gray are, are uh, various mechanical room spaces. Uh, we have located a trash room internal to the building on the ground floor, which is adequately sized to accommodate the necessary uh, refuse, recycling, and cardboard containers. Uh, trash would be uh, collected here. Uh, we have a refuse uh, chute internal to the building with access on each residential floor of the building that terminates on the ground floor where trash would be collected and brought out to the street uh, for pickup. Also on the ground floor, we're providing a secure bicycle storage room, which provides approximately 116, bar uh, 116 bicycle parking spaces which complies with the requirement associated with the residential office and retail uses on the ground floor. Um, and lastly, on the ground floor, we have a small amenity space uh, in the northeast corner of uh, the building on the ground floor. 
So with that then, that brings us to the second floor of the building. So as noted, uh, the ground floor use is uh, residential. Uh, we have the residential lobby. Um, as permitted in the zone, uh, we are permitted two levels of office. So we are providing approximately 28,950 square feet of office uh, across two levels, uh, which are located at levels two and three, compliant with the design standards of the redevelopment plan. Um, and additionally, this office has its own secure access from the ground floor. Uh, that's this darker blue area here with a secure uh, vestibule access. It has its own vertical access and vertical accessibility with an elevator core and separate means of egress uh, from that of the residential building. And we've designed this, uh, this office space could be divided into multiple tenants or alternately perhaps it's one larger space uh, that's to be determined. But again, uh, a state-of-the-art office space here, which has uh, windows on the, uh, on the Western and Southern frontage of uh, Summit and Academy Street. That brings us to the fourth floor of the building. So levels four through 18 are the residential levels of the building. Uh, the project as proposed comprise of uh, 223 new residential apartment units. Uh, the unit mix breakdown consists of approximately 95 studio units. Uh, there are 84 one bedroom units. There are 39 two bedroom units and five three bedroom units. Uh, one point to note that there is, a, uh, there is technically a requirement that we provide a minimum of 2% of uh, three bedrooms for the project and we are complying with that. Uh, this first level of residential, we are also providing a small amenity space of approximately uh, 1800 square feet. Um, that's located here in the area of Pushade and Pink. Um, and, that, and that has access to a small outdoor courtyard amenity area that would have passive seating areas for uh, residents within the community um, and some green space providing some buffer to the edges of the building. Um, the upper floors of the residential building here uh, provide for a double loaded corridor and a modified L-shaped building. Uh, the application before the board this evening, as noted by Mr. Pepe, is a substantially conforming application, uh, barring two exceptions, um, two C variances, the first of which uh, has to deal with the minimum rear yard step back requirement of 70 feet. So there's a minimum rear yard setback uh, requirement of 70 feet from either of the right-of-ways uh, uh, being Summit Avenue or Academy Street. Um, and we're, we are proposing approximately 75 feet. And you can see that 75 foot dimension here at the top of the screen and also on the side of the screen here for the depth of the building. So essentially the building is 75 feet deep. It's a double loaded corridor. It complies with the building code. It provides adequate light and air to the residential apartment units. And uh, the reason that we're asking for this is that uh, typically uh, that 70 foot setback requirement is associated with typical lot depths of 100 feet, uh, where our lot as proposed has, has depths that are greater than 100 feet. Uh, so the lot depth from Academy Street is greater than 115 feet in depth. And the lot depth from Summit Avenue is greater than 135 feet in depth. So with the typical corner lot that would be of, of a dimension of 100 by 100. If you provided that, uh, if you complied with the 70 foot uh, uh, setback or step back, that would uh, leave approximately a 30 by 30 uh, foot open area in the corner of the, of the property, which is approximately 900 square feet. So again, as you can see here, our lot has shown, we have uh, depths that are greater than 100 feet. And what we end up with uh, uh, left over here in the rear yard is a dimension of approximately 40 feet by 60 feet, and that is a square footage of approximately, um, I have my number here, uh, it's approximately 2,400 square feet. So, so that's you know, substantially larger than the 30 by 30 area, provides adequate light and air for the residential units, and, and you know, in our opinion is a, a de minimis uh, a waiver deviation associated with the project. Uh, and I believe Mr. Collins will speak more to that um, the project does comply with uh, the front yard setback. It complies with the side yard setbacks. It complies with the building coverage and the other bulk ordinance standards. It complies with the minimum sidewalk widths at the ground floor along Summit Avenue as well as Academy Street. It provides for a, a, a marketable new residential development. Um, advancing the slide here, this takes us to the typical fifth through ninth floor plan of the building. Um, so as shown here, the units generally stack. 
Uh, the unit mix, again, is uh, comprised of studios, ones, twos, and a handful of threes. Um, we have two elevator cores in the center of the building. As noted, there is a trash room located on each floor of the building with an internal trash chute uh, collecting at the ground floor of the building at the refuse termination room. So advancing the slide here um, to sheet move my thing uh, to sheet A06. Uh, this is the roof plan. So the project does pr uh, provide for a rooftop amenity penthouse structure, uh, which complies with the appropriate uh, square footage requirements in regards to the rooftop coverage, as well as mechanical units. Um, so we have a, a enclosed uh, amenity penthouse structure, which is approximately 2,300 square feet, provides for a state-of-the-art club room, uh, what we're calling a sky lounge for residents of the community, which would offer uh, commanding views to the east of, of uh, the Manhattan skyline, as well as the downtown Jersey City skyline. Uh, there's also a small private event room, which could be rented out for, uh, by residents of the community. And each of these spaces would have direct access to the exterior for outdoor dining and passive recreation for uh, residents of this new community. Again, uh, this use is a permitted use within the redevelopment plan. Is an, it is also an encouraged use in regards to an activated rooftop um, and smart green design uh, principles. So then advancing the slide here, this is a typical building section. So again, to note, uh, the project as proposed is for a new mixed use 18 story building with a rooftop amenity penthouse. Uh, the building height is approximately 198 feet, uh, compliant with the permitted building height and the applicable bonuses. Uh, the ground floor use being that of the residential lobby here shown in yellow, a small retail space of 860 square feet, uh, two levels of offices on uh, levels two and three with their own vertical circulation, and then 15 levels of residential above. Uh, and then again, the building stepping back at that uppermost level to provide for a rooftop amenity deck. Um, one of the items here that I'll also talk about then is the second uh, deviation that we're requesting this evening, which is related to the minimum ceiling height at the ground floor non-residential uses. Uh, the bulk ordinance requires 20 feet where the project as proposed uh, provides for 13 feet, six inches minimum at uh, some back of house mechanical room spaces and 15 feet, 11 inches at, at the max area. Uh, the retail area itself provides for a, a clear floor to ceiling height of approximately 15 feet, eight inches. The residential lobby provides for a ceiling height of 14 feet, two inches. And the office lobby provides for a ceiling height of 13 feet, nine inches. Advance the slide here to sheet A17. Uh, this is an illustrative perspective rendering, which is a view looking east along Summit Avenue. Uh, so Summit, Ave uh, so, uh, Summit is in the foreground here and Academy Street here to the right. Uh, the main residential lobby and office lobby uh, at about the midpoint of the building as it, as it fronts on Summit Avenue, providing an attractive uh, and secure entry to the building with an architectural slung canopy above. Uh, in my opinion, the intent, and, and uh, per the redevelopment plan, the intent of the 20-foot floor to ceiling height uh, relates to the proportion of the ground floor of the building or the base of the building to that of the height or, or the mass of the building. Um, and as seen here uh, in the design of the building, with the ground floor lobby as shown and the two levels of offices above, I believe that architecturally we're providing a, 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 a base to the building here and providing a true uh, a base middle top reading uh, for the project. And then additionally, uh, the clear heights being provided uh, at the residential lobby, uh, the office lobby and the retail spaces are all appropriate for those uses. So again, we're providing approximately 14 feet, two inches at the resident at the at the office lobby, um, or I'm sorry, at the residential lobby, uh, 13 feet, nine inches at the office lobby. And at the retail space, we're providing a clear height of 15 feet, eight inches uh, for a small 860 square foot office space. Um, the other intent of it is to provide for an activated ground floor, right? Um, and and uh, use. So, so the design of the project provides for elegant storefront windows, which, which uh, wrap the corner, uh, provide a human scale to the architecture and an activated use on that, on that streetscape and help to anchor the corner and uh, create a, a pedestrian friendly streetscape. So again, in my opinion, it's a minor deviation. And I believe uh, Mr. Collings will speak more to that uh, in his testimony. Um, 
But with that, I'll, I'll uh, stay on this slide here for just one more minute. Um, so as you can see here, the exterior building materials being proposed for the project uh, consist of quality and rich building materials. Um, they consist of masonry brick veneer, as well as uh, two different colors of, com of uh, composite metal panel, actually three different colors of composite metal panel uh, that are being used on the project. Uh, the ground floor windows at the residential lobby that wrap that corner and help to activate the facade and the street frontage uh, provide for aluminum storefront windows in a uh, black frame, uh, which, which uh, creates some pop and contrast. There are contemporary elements uh, such as the architectural canopy, uh, slung canopy over the residential entrance and the office entrance uh, that provide for relief on the facade. And then at uh, levels two and three, where we have our proposed office use, again, larger windows uh, with aluminum frames, uh, uh, providing for clear light into those uses. And advancing the slide here to sheet A18, uh, this is a illustrative perspective rendering, which is an aerial view looking northeast. Um, so now we get a sense of the massing of the building. We've designed the building to comply with the design standards of the redevelopment plan. Um, and in particular, creating a base, middle, and top reading to the project. So with some of the projected frame elements in the mid portion of the building and through variation of building materials, I, you know, I believe that through the residential lobby on the ground floor, the two levels of office at level two and three, and the projected frames above, we've successfully created a, a weighted base to the building that helps to anchor the street corner at Summit and Academy. And again, provides relief at the upper floors of the building. Um, I noted that we have uh, three different uh, composite metal panel colors that are, be used, uh, that are being used for the project. There's this lighter silver color being used at the upper portions of the building that uh, drives down on the corner, uh, helping to anchor the building uh, where it's chamfered at the intersection of uh, Summit and Academy. There's a champagne, or, or actually it's called a sandstone color, but sort of a champagne uh, hue being used on the insides of these frames. Um, and then we have this darker charcoal or iron gray composite metal panel color of this, of this projected frame element, which creates a shadow line and some relief on the facade. And again, uh, darker metal windows at the, residential, uh, at the residential floors, as well as the office and uh, the ground floor lobby. So advancing uh, sheets A11 uh, through 12, 13, and 14 are our typical exterior building elevations uh, with the uh, requisite uh, uh, exterior building material callouts, as well as the details of the uh, typical residential windows. Uh, all the residential floors have a minimum ceiling height of nine feet compliant with the minimum uh, ceiling heights for that use. Um, Sheet A12 here is the south building elevation that fronts on Academy Street. So you can see how we're taking those same quality building materials from uh, that of Summit, uh, wrapping that to Academy to provide for an activated uh, ground floor use and an articulated upper levels of the residential building. Sheet A13 here is the east facing elevation. Uh, we have designed an articulated punched window design. Uh, this is where the building steps back approximately five feet from the adjoining uh, building. So uh, we're limited on, on, on the number of openings we can have on that facade, but we're using the same colors of uh, composite metal panel as we begin to, to turn to the side and rear facing elevations for the proposed building. And that brings us to sheet A14, which is the north facing uh, building elevation. This, is, this uh, generally is the rear elevation of the building. Um, so again, uh, floor to ceiling glass where we can accommodate it. Uh, each unit has a through wall PTAC uh, uh, providing, um, uh, providing uh, the mechanical heating and cooling system to the unit. Uh, we've designed a integral grill that goes into that window frame, uh, which mitigates the impact of that and screens the uh, PTAC sleeve. And then uh, that brings us to sheet A10. So I do want to get on the record that we are proposing for three new signs for the project. Uh, there's one residential sign being proposed one office sign and one retail sign. Uh, each of these signs are canopy mounted letters. They're, uh, they're uh, dimensionally cut letters that are LED halo lit atop the residential canopy or the office canopy, the retail canopy. Uh, each of these uh, do comply in regards to the minimum and maximum size requirements uh, that are spelled out in the redevelopment plan. 
lastly, that brings us back to the illustrative perspective rendering. Um, so we're excited to be able to share this with uh, the board this evening. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Johnson, thank you so much. Before we go there, this illustrative rendering, this was not something that we submitted with our original application, I believe? It was not, that's correct. We have two new exhibits this evening, I believe A18 and A17, which are two new illustrative perspective renderings of the proposed development. And they are All right, so let's mark A17 as A2 for the board and a18 as A3. Thank you. I, I have no additional uh, questions for Mr. Johnson. Okay, thanks, Council. Um, Mr. Johnson, thank you for the, the detailed presentation. Uh, it really doesn't leave me with many questions. Uh, the only one I do have is the ground floor. You show a fire reserve room. Is that a command center or is that a secondary? tank just pass it there it is sure yeah so so this is an 18-story building and we are under the high-rise building code and uh, we will be required to have a reserve tank likely on site uh, and that's what that room is being proposed as there's also a fire command center, uh, which is being labeled here as FCC, which has direct access off the main residential lobby. It's on the main, uh, the main corridor and access coming into the building uh, for first responders. But uh, you're correct, I think, in your first assumption is that that fire reserve is a, uh, is a uh, surplus tank. Okay. Yeah, the, the room just looked a little small to me for a, you know, a secondary tank, but I'm sure... It'll be engineered properly. Um, okay, that's it for me. Anybody else, any questions? Anybody else, anybody from the board, no questions? Nope. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Johnson. So thank I you. will move to Mr. Colling then. And while Mr. Collings coming up, uh, he has been sworn, he is under oath already tonight, and he is qualified. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening again. Um, and as I recognize, I'm still uh, under oath. Um, so I'll just jump right into the, the testimony. Um, I think that the our, our architect, Mr. Stewart, has done an excellent job in presenting the project. So I won't go into any a lot of detail on on that. Um, just to, just to mention that the the location is uh, within about a five minute walk of General Square and the transportation center. Um, it is rather large and a portion of the site is developed with a six story building currently and this portion of the site is currently just used for uh, surface parking. The proposed building will be 18 stories in height and 198 feet and I just want to reinforce that that is a permitted height. Uh, because this is in a uh, a bonus, you know the bonus is within the district Four. this is an a corner. Um, it also has the office space which is permitted which adds uh, 28 feet and two stories. And then there's an additional 40 feet permitted under an arts uh, contribution bonus, which we're taking advantage of. And that brings us up to 198 feet and 18 stories. Um, the purpose of this zone is to provide for new housing, office space and other parcels within a 10 minute walk of Journal Square. Uh, so I just want to point out that we are in very, very, um, uh, very good compliance with that intent, intent and purpose. And we're asking for two, um, just two deviations as was mentioned by Stuart. Um, the rear yard, and I think Stuart did an excellent explanation. I don't think I need to repeat that at all. Uh, we, are, we are much deeper on both uh, sides, either measuring from Summit or from Academy. The area in the back that we are providing is over two and a half times what you would expect to find in a typical um, 10,000 square foot corner lot. 
So we more than meet the intent of that uh, rear yard uh, criteria and we provide adequate air and light. And I've mentioned that the adjoining buildings as well extend much further so we're not, we're not in, uh, imposing upon any rear yard that they would have because the older building on the corner of Rock Street extends about 150 feet deep and the newer building, which is, we share this parcel with, extends all the way through the Rock Street. So there's no substantial detriment to the adjoining properties. Uh, the project in general meets the intent and purpose of the zone plan and of the general square plan in general. Um, and we provide more light air open space than you would expect to find on a typical lot. So it benefits substantially outweigh the detriments and you also have the hardship of the uh, lar larger lot and the deeper lot. In terms of the ground floor height, um, I wanna point out that the minimum uh, ground floor standard was created when the journal square plan was first developed and prior to the office space bonus. So what happens in a situation where you do provide the, off, uh, op, the office space is that you actually end up with a, a larger base by virtue of the office space itself. So in this particular case, in the way the building is designed and incorporating the office space, the, the office space added to the ground floor really creates the substantial base which grounds the building and I think meets the intent of that 20 foot criteria. Um, the the uh, And as you saw from the perspectives, uh, the base more or less reflects the height of the existing uh, residential building that's on the corner of Rock Street as well. I think it helps it fit into the, the neighborhood well and the streetscape, and it provides for the, uh, the, again, the intent and purpose of having the substantial base. I think the architects had an excellent job of breaking the building into having the base, the middle, and the upper portions. So although we don't, we don't meet the letter of the law in terms of the ground floor height. I think from an aesthetic perspective, from the visual perspective, how the building uh, interfaces with the public realm, we more than meet the intent and purpose of that, of that criteria. And given that the building, the development in general, meets the intent and purpose of the redevelopment plan and of the zone four uh, purposes, I think you can see that the uh, the project, the benefits of this project substantially outweigh uh, any detriment. The project promotes a pattern of mixed use development where that is one of the primary intent and purposes of the redevelopment plan. Uh, it makes biking and walking easy and safe. It's convenient to transportation. It encourages local retail by having the commercial space on, the, uh, on, on um, Academy Street. Um, meets multiple, multiple intent and purposes of the redevelopment plan. I don't think I need to go into extensive detail on that. So I think when you add up the benefits of this project uh, and the rather minor impacts of these rather relatively minor deviations, you can see that the uh, approval of this project would result in a situation where the benefits would substantially outweigh any detriment and there would be no substantial detriment really in, in, my, in my view. And so I think the, the deviations that, are, as requested, can be granted. Thank you, Mr. Collins. All right. Thank you, Mr. Colling. Uh, anybody, any questions? OK, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I did receive. So that really completes my presentation this evening. I did receive an engineering review memo dated 216. Uh, it has the standard boilerplate language. There was nothing really that stood out as a requirement, but part of that boilerplate is the requirement to pave the street frontage on both sides of the project, which we will do, but we would like to discuss that with engineering to their satisfaction if it's not necessarily the right time to do it or if it's already been done by somebody else. Absolutely, I agree. Okay, so at this time, uh, let's open it up for public comment. If anybody's here from the public that wants to comment, please raise your hand. If you are calling in, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Anybody from the public, if you want to comment, please raise your hand. Mr. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close the public. Second. Okay, motion Second. and seconded. Public is closed. Uh, Tim, do you have anything else to add? We've seen your staff report. Yeah, not too much. Um, <clears throat> just that in my staff report, uh, I'm basically echoing a lot of the, the things that the uh, applicants uh, experts have discussed. Um, I really like the development. Um, 
I think um, given the language in the 2060 redevelopment plan, this really fits um, what they've asked for. Um, the one thing is that uh, I have a condition, my staff recommended conditions upon approval are basically standard except for number five, which is prior to the memorialization of a resolution by a Jersey City Planning Board, a redeveloper's agreement between the applicant and Jersey City Redevelopment Agency shall be provided to city planning that details the funds to be dedicated to the city fund for public arts as outlined in the Journal Square 2060 redevelopment plan. Um, besides that, um, you know, if we just get that before, uh, you know, if and when this is approved, uh, you know, if they can satisfy that uh, condition and everything's fine. Council, do you uh, have a problem with that? Can you? No, I, I honestly, I don't have a problem at all with the fundamental requirement. It is part of the plan. I, I guess I'm just scratching my head a little bit at the timing because I, it could, in my opinion, just as easily be incorporated as a condition of my approval that it be done not necessarily done before a resolution is memorialized. I just wonder about the timing. You know, it's it's probably not something with with my experience with the JCRA that I'm going to get in place in two weeks, four weeks, maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks. I know it needs to be done, but holding up the resolution pending entering into that agreement seems unnecessary if it is simply a condition of my approval. Well, if I'm looking at the way that resolutions go, if you're going to pull permits, I mean, should we, yeah, we can put language in it that says, you know, certificate of, certificate of occupancy. And then if it's not, agree, you know, done by them, we can go that route. Yeah, I don't have a problem if we, uh, if we attach it to a, a TCO or a CO. I'd be willing to accept that. That that would be preferable. I'd appreciate if that. If the board allows it. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with uh let's make the language either a TCO or a CO. Okay. Okay, thanks, Tim. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion at this time to approve case P uh two zero dash one five five as presented to the board here tonight. Second. Motion made and seconded for approval. Vice Chairman Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Torres. Aye. Commissioner Gangadon. Aye. Very nice project. Very good presentation. Very detailed. Yep. Thank you. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Cruz. Aye. Dr. Desai. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Yeah, it's a nice project. Uh, I think it's going to be a good addition to the neighborhood, uh, along with the uh, applicants' other properties. So, yeah, that's it's an easy eye for me. Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners. You have a great evening. Thank you. All in favor, motion passes with staff conditions. All right. Thanks, Tim. All right, everybody. Let's move on to memorialization of resolutions, please. If I, unless I missed something. Well, I think you're good, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the following resolutions. Uh, or to, I'm sorry, to memorialize the following resolutions. There's 13 of them. Uh, first one is applicant TRG, Summit LLC, and Summit and SIP LLC for preliminary and final major site plan with deviations and conditions. Address 415-425 Summit Avenue, block 10704, lots two and six, case number P20-098. Next resolution is applicant 14-16 Burma Road Industrial LLC for preliminary and final major site plan with deviations address at 14-16 Burma Road, block 23404, lot eight, case number P20-136. Third resolution is applicant Laundry Time JC LLC for preliminary and final major site plan Address at 756-758 Communipa Avenue, Block 18301, Lots 44, 45, and 46, Case number P20-074. Next resolution is for amendments to the Jackson Hill RDP, 
applicant to Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church and Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Newark, Block 24001, Lots 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 72. Next uh, resolution is applicant BLDG 333, Newark, LLC, for final major site plan administrative amendment Address is at 333 Norick Ave, Block 11001, Lot 4, Case Number P20-137. Next resolution uh, is applicant BNK Property LLC for minor site plan. Address at 57 Virginia Avenue, Block 21102, Lot 48, Case Number P19191. <coughs> Resolution number seven is applicant 12 Nevin LLC for preliminary and final major site plan with variances, address 16 to 20 Nevin Street, block 15004, lots 40, 41, and 42, case number P19 171. Next resolution is applicant 900 Bergen LLC for preliminary and final major site plan with a variance. Address 900 Bergen Avenue, Block 10701, Lot 4, Case Number P20-114. Next resolution is in the matter of the Master Plan Reexamination Report regarding amendments to the Jersey City Master Plan land use and circulation elements. This resolution is in the matter of the Webster Avenue Redevelopment Plan rescind and adoption of zone. Next resolution is for a one-year site plan extension of the previously approved minor site plan with applicants Zheng, Z-H-E-N-G, also known as Larry, last name is Li, L-I, and Lei Wong for extension of minor site plan with variance approval, property 278 Grand Street, block 14105, lot 9, case P20-008. Uh, Resolution number 12 is applicant Lucy Munoz for minor site plan address at 383 Palisade Avenue, block 3901, lot 28, case number P20-084. And last resolution is applicant Stonebridge Capital LLC for preliminary and final major site plan approval with a C variance. Uh, uh, address is 855-857 Bergen Avenue, Jersey City, New Jersey, block 12107, lots 25 and 26, case number P20-082. Okay, could I have a second, please? Second. All right, could we have a roll call on the resolutions? Yes, uh, Vice Chairman Gonzalez. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Torres. Aye. Commissioner Gingadin. Aye. Commissioner Desai. Aye. Commissioner Cruz. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Uh, Council President Waterman. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Aye. Okay, all in favor, motion carries. We do have a hand raised here. Yeah, oh, we I have some questions I about- I just want to address, uh, address that <laughs> for Mr. Toussaint. Maybe he wasn't, uh, he wasn't on in the beginning of the Not meeting. Really. Let me bring him up. I think he put his hand down. Where'd he go? Oh, there he goes. Do you want me to promote him or you just want to answer it? Um, no, you can promote them. Okay. Well, I think you did. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So I think I'm here. Yeah. Yes, here. We got you. So Mr. Toussaint, Hi. um, I don't know if you weren't, maybe you weren't on at the beginning of the meeting. I was um, not. I, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's all right. Um, yeah, we had a a little mishap with the city's data portal. Uh, it was down for a little while, a few days. So uh, we found that, you know, the applications, certain applications weren't available for the entire period for public view. So, you know, to err on the side of caution, just to make sure that everybody from the public has a chance to review everything. Um, we carried a new a number of <laughs> applications tonight, to say the least. 
Um, yeah, so 43 Belmont Ave was one of those applications. Uh, it's been okay. carried to March 9th. All right, cool. I will mark my calendar for March 9th. Okay, thank you. I apologize that you know you hung on so long for us tonight. That's all right. This was a riveting discussion. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for calling it that. All right. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Okay. Uh, do we need an executive session? Anybody? No. Okay. Can we move on with our lives? I do not, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. So I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. Sure. I'd like to make a motion to, to adjourn. Second it. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. We're adjourned, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thanks, Bye. Jeffrey, get that bike Bye. ready.